Want to take a ride? From the high desert and the great American Southwest, exclusively on Sirius XM Radio, this is Dark Matter with your host, Art Bell. Now, here's Art. Extra terrestrial radio, actually. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another week of Dark Matter. I am Art Bell. And I've got an awful lot for you tonight. Oh, man, it is packed tonight. And I'm going to do something I always want to do anyway. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, Oh, listen, I don't make movie recommendations lightly. Really. I I can think of maybe two or three movies in in my life that I've ever recommended on the air. Of course, Contact. And now, Gravity. Oh, God, what a movie. I, I went to see it in IMAX 3D. Gravity. And it is a killer. I mean, it is, as far as I can see, with, you know, very tiny exception, it's uh, flawless. It is, it's so good that when you're sitting in the theater, make sure you see it in IMAX 3D. Don't mess around with the other stuff. When you see it in the theater, you will feel like you're in space. You will identify with the characters, and you're, you're going to feel like you're there. So, whatever you do, scrounge together the bucks and see gravity in IMAX 3D if you can. Big time recommendation. Don't let it get, don't let it get away. Don't wait for the smaller screen. Trust me on this. There are a few movies that come out that deserve to be seen on the, you know, on the big screen uh, in 3D. And this is the one. <laughs> All right, turning now uh, to many comments on our guest list. You can readily see now that on Monday we have scheduled Dr. Roger Lear. On Tuesday we have Too Soon to Tell. I wonder, could that be an Indian name? Hmm. Wednesday we have Check Back Later. And Thursday comes the very controversial Cannot Predict Now. <laughs> it's a it's an anti poaching measure, folks. So be surprised every day for a while here. Okay. The ghost photo contest I said was over on Sunday because Keith Rowland, my webmaster extraordinaire, told me to say it was over on Sunday. What he didn't tell me is not this coming Sunday. But next Sunday, meaning you have one more week this week to get your ghost photographs in. Winner takes away a brand new Sirius XM radio and a one-year subscription to Sirius XM. So, hey, if you've got a ghost photo laying upstairs from your grandma, you know, scan it, get it over, whatever. Winner takes away a radio and a one-year subscription. Ghost stories come uh, to me. Well, the ghost photographs, don't send them to me, please. Send them to webmaster at artbell.com. Webmaster at artbell.com. Ghost stories, on the other hand, come to me. That's for our show called Spooky Matter. Thank you, Bell Gab, for being the board to suggest that name. They're a board that follows a show or sometimes poisons it with comments. Oh, you hate that guest. You hate him. They're pretty brutal, but as I've said, vaguely lovable. (laughs) Anyway, spooky matter stories. um, Just give me a little capsule version, a paragraph maybe or two at the most, and include your phone number, and maybe on spooky matter we will call you. All right, here comes the heavy-duty, man, you got to check it out stuff. The first thing, uh, the first thing I've got up is going to just rock your world. We have talked many times of shadow people on this show, right? Shadow people. A lot of people go, oh, come on. What if I were to tell you I've got a video, uh, and it's a security camera piece of footage of a man being attacked by a shadow person. And if you can debunk this thing, have at it, baby. 
What happens in this video is a man's walking down the hall. You can see the dark shadow thing approach him. You can see it throw him on his, you know, face plant. I mean, he falls down. Then he's turned around. Then he is dragged by something invisible down the hall or this shadow thing, whichever you want to believe. I'm telling you, this one is, well, it's either fake and CGI'd, right, by somebody who knows really what they're doing, or it's real. This thing is scary. Um, I will be asking tomorrow's guest, too soon to tell, about this, uh, <laughs> about this video. But you can see it right now, and I recommend you, uh, you go up there and see it. It's an attack of a shadow uh, being of a man. Simple as that. Uh, caught on security camera footage, and it is really, really good. I mean really good. So it's up on ArtBell.com right now. And when you go to ArtBell.com, you will see these various things flashing on the screen. Just don't touch the screen. Wait for the shadow person attack. Then the second item is going to blow your doors off, too. My second item is of a NASA scientist admitting to this lady who called him, interviewed him, that NASA has chemtrails. He uses the term chemtrails. Now, he says they are lithium gas. Lithium gas. No, not the lithium uh, that, you know, you're given for a psychiatric condition of some sort. Lithium gas, he says, to track the movements of the atmosphere, high levels, whatever. But, you know, it's a metal, right? I think. And there is an old thing about what goes up must uh, well, come down, right? So, never, I, I really think, Keith, I'll tell you what Keith said. He said, I think it's the first admission of a government official of anything like this. And Dr. Lear, if you're there, just hang in there. I've got a couple things I've got to do tonight, or that I'm going to do tonight. I don't have to do them. And then the final, final item, I, I, I mean, when you hear a NASA scientist admitting chemtrails, yeah, we're doing it. You know, that rocks you back a little bit. Normally. You hear about chemtrails and you go, mm, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. But good heavens to Betsy. When you hear a NASA scientist say, yeah, chemtrails are chemtrails. <laughs> it blew me away. So there is that. And then finally, um, this may not be the real McCoy. Because I admit there are some problems in my view of the way this thing moves it's a dragon now you don't get videos of dragons just every day it's a dragon over england and it looks awfully realistic except in my opinion for sometimes the way it moves its wings or i'm just looking for a problem with it i don't know maybe hooey but it's a dragon somebody got it on video over england and you don't get dragons every day in fact i have never had such a giant load of really, really good videos to present to all of you. Where are they all? Simple. Artbell.com. www.artbell.com. I would like for you, if you have a moment, uh, I know you're busy because I'm sending you to do all these things, go to the internet and look up the words to Stairway to Heaven, song Stairway to Heaven. If you have never actually read the words to Stairway to Heaven, I would like you to go uh, to the internet and look them up. Because I'm going to play it, the whole darn thing. I said it's my show, I can do what I want, so I'm going to do it. When I come back from break, before Dr. Lear. Okay. Um, a second... Oarfish. Now, these oarfish are really rare, deep trawlers in the ocean. You don't see them unless you're in a deep sub or something. Has washed ashore in California. This is not good. 
or fish uh, generally are, if they're ever seen at all, very rare, maybe seen in Japan, somewhere like that, right? But now a second oarfish has come ashore in California. Now, they're looked, oarfish are looked at kind of like comets. They portend change and possibly doom. Doom, I tell you. I'm, I'm not necessarily a believer, but uh, probably not good. You know, we've got this Fukushima thing going on, right? And uh, I'll leave it at that. A low-pitched dr- uh, droning sound has tormented residents of Southampton now for 18 months. No relief. No explanation in sight. It's every night. So some people have resorted to using sleeping pills or moving away just to get a good night's sleep. Because this thing wakes you up. But England is only the latest in an ever-growing lengthy list of cities and towns plagued by exactly this sort of sound around the world. We've had it here in the U.S. Weird strumming, thumbing, thumping sounds under the ground that will not allow you to sleep. Update on Comet Ison. It suggests the comet is still intact, despite the predictions of many that the icy nucleus might disintegrate as the sun warms it. So we could still be in for a treat closest pass on November 28th. Oh, we've got, uh, we've got, I got this email. Uh, it says, Art, as soon as I unwrap my new dark matter mug, my cat Bertie came to check it out. Been enjoying the show every night over the internet. Now, shopping for portable XM radio use on the road, in my car, and on my motorcycle. Now, that is devotion. Listening on a motorcycle. What you should be doing is paying attention to what you're doing. Anyway, he sent a picture of his cat with a little face stuffed down into the Art Bell cup. Dark matter cup. <laughs> My cats do the same thing. They don't like water from any other source than a human cup. I think that my cats have calculated that if it's in a human cup, it's better water. Better. It's got to be better. And if it's milk, that's good too. So, you're probably going, ew, you let your cats drink out of your glass? Yeah, we do. We'll talk about that sometime. All right, um, coming up in just a little while, Dr. Roger Lear and Dr. Lear, relax, we have lots of time. This is Sirius XM, where, well, there's virtually time for everything. Raging in the nighttime. This is Dark Matter. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I'm Art Bell. And it's going to be quite a night. Stay right where you are. All that stuff up on artbell.com. So if you haven't done it yet, for God's sakes, don't do it if you're in a truck. Especially if you're on the road. You know, if you're stopped, maybe. But otherwise, don't get tempted. Somehow I have this vision of some guy in an 18-wheeler, you know, with a, I don't know, iPhone 5 in his hand, trying to manipulate his way to artbell.com. No. <laughs> Don't do it. Dr. Roger K. Lear is author of Aliens and the Scalpel, first and second edition. In other words, two of them. UFO crash at uh, in Brazil, rather. Casebook, Alien Implants, Chopped Liver, and three other books published outside the U.S. Has been said to have been one of the world's most important leaders in physical evidence research involving the field of ufology. He and his surgical team have performed 16 surgeries on alleged alien abductees. This resulted in the removal of 17, somebody must have had two, 17 separate and distinct objects suspected of being alien implants. These objects have been scientifically investigated by some of the most prestigious labs in the world. Their findings have been baffling 
and some comparisons have been made to meteorite samples. Dr. Lear continues to investigate the physiological and biological aspects of the abduction phenomenon. He has also formed a non-profit organization for this purpose called ANS Research Inc. It has been a long time since I've heard Dr. Lear's voice. Doctor, welcome. Hello, Art. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's been way, way too long. Really good it, to hear your voice. It's a real pleasure uh, being on the show again, and it uh, takes me back a few years. Well, incredibly happy to have you. Um, it is, uh, it's a whole new ball game up here, buddy. We have time. You just wouldn't believe how much time we have and how few commercials we have. <laughs> oh, baby, it's something else. All right. You have done some of the most incredible work in ufology, period. It's as simple as that. I mean, taking implants out of people. And, of course, at the same time, You've been a ufologist. So you're a doctor. You're a ufologist. Um, I, I don't know. Um, you tell me about yourself. Well, I got real busy. I was uh, interrupted for a bit with uh, a very uh, nasty, nasty virus, Ooh. which uh, today is called shingles, which uh, led to a seven-hour surgery and about 20 days in the hospital. So that... Uh, kind of put me uh, out of commission for a while, but I'm back. You know, I have heard yeah. that shingles are the single most painful thing that can happen to a human being. Is that... That is 100% on. That is the truth. But the, uh, the subject of shingles from a medical aspect has been absolutely uh, aborted. It's, um, it's been turned into something of a, an absolute lie. And uh, I was, uh, you know, somehow uh, the victim of, the, of one of those uh, lies. Uh, shingles has absolutely or nothing to do with the chicken pox virus. Oh, oh, no, they didn't lie to me on TV, did they? I if you don't. have chicken, I saw that. If you have, if you had chicken pox, you already have the shingles virus in you. Now, if you believe that, I've got several bridges that I want to sell. Well, you're kind of in the bridge selling business anyway, right? A little bit, right? But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> any of our listeners can check this out if they want to do a little simple research. Uh, I looked at the virus that caused uh, shingles so many years ago. It's funny it got renamed because it was uh, called herpes zoster. And it was uh, like uh, comparing that to herpes simplex, which is the virus that causes uh, chicken pox, was like uh, come looking at a, a German shepherd and uh, squeak your cat. Right. Uh, uh, incidentally, I don't know if you ever knew, but uh, you have squeaked the cat, I have squeaked the rabbit. <laughs> maybe they never meet. Uh, maybe. Um, listen, are you, are you healed? You're better now? Uh, yeah. As I said, I'm back uh, doing my thing again and uh, have been for a while. Um, I still they didn't, have they didn't find anything else in, in there, did they, uh, with the shingles? No, no, but I had to wind up having uh, two uh, arterial bypasses done because I wound up with a hole about as big as a uh, baseball in my ankle, and that had to be filled in with a graft and all that sort of uh, wonderful things. That, uh, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, been uh, quite an experience. But Yeah, uh, you've really been through it. You've really been yeah. through it. All right. Okay. Uh, but, right. you know, I made the best of it. I got a new book coming out, which should be out next month, which I can't remember. I can't mention the name because of the agreement with the publisher. Ooh. But I can say that the uh, foreword was written by uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, uh, the astronaut from Apollo Excellent. 14. Excellent, so, of course. Really uh, looking forward to that coming out. And it's got a lot of the new information, uh, which uh, we haven't talked about in uh, years. But we found stuff that uh, has gone far, far beyond what we had talked about in latter years. Can you talk about it later tonight? I would love to. In fact, uh, really? okay. I had Keith uh, 
put a report up on the uh, website. So if uh, people want to go to uh, artbell.com, they can uh, take a look. There's some uh, pictures up there, too. There are ultra micro photographs. And uh, when we talk about this, then they'll be able to see, actually see the things that I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, I've got the website right next to me, so I'll, I'll be going over there to take a look myself. Um, all right. Um, are you still uh, performing surgeries for the removal of alien implants? Yes. Uh, in short, we're getting ready to uh, perform two more of them. Uh, all I need to do now is uh, put in place the funding. And uh, we have a couple of uh, individuals who I think are going to come through with that. So we'll have uh, at least two more uh, to run through the fires of uh, research examination. All right. If I were to come to you, doctor, and say, and being very serious, and say, look, I really think I was abducted. I think that I've got an implant right here. I'll say my leg, just for, as an example. I've got an implant in my leg. It, it occurred uh, or happened during the abduction. I've got a little scar here left from it that you can see. I, I'm kind of curious what, how you would vet me. In other words, how you would um, treat me and, and how it would go. Uh, basically, we would uh, begin by putting you through a rather a rigorous uh, examination in relation to your experience, and uh, we, we really wouldn't expect to see a scar. So if you had a scar, we would probably say bye-bye. All right. The scar is gone. It's, uh, it's in there. The it, magically, it's in there. I have no scar. Now what? Okay, now you say you have an implant there, so uh, I have to know that's true. So uh, along uh, with your... I'm telling you, I'm telling you it's true, Doctor. I I believe you 100%, except uh, (laughs) I have to send this stuff to the lab and another scientist, so uh, they have to believe you too. So you have to show me some x-rays or at least a CAT scan or something like that that shows you have a foreign object. Now, we don't know what it is, but at least we know you have a foreign object. Okay. That's so, so in other one. words, all right, so you would send me away to get either an x-ray, if it would show in an x-ray, or, I don't know, an MRI, whatever, uh, at my own expense. I'd have to pay for it, right? No. Uh, no, oh, uh, no examinations, treatment, or surgery that uh, is under the auspices of ANS Research. Is there any charges made? Also, oh, oh. if we do find something uh, and you want it taken out, you has to be your idea. You want it, not ours. Well, I hate it. It's in there, and I, it, it's bothering me, so I want it gone, of course. Now, do I have to sign a lot of papers and stuff saying that I will donate my object to you when, when we're all done? Exactly. Uh, it becomes the property of not ANS research. It becomes the property of the civilization of this planet. And uh, we promise uh, to keep you totally informed of any information which is elicited from the research that uh, this reveals. Uh, but uh, we every, every bit of your personal information is kept 100% confidential. So if a television program comes along and wants to do a show and we want to show them the footage uh, and uh, you don't want your face shown or you don't want your object shown, that's the uh, liberty that we assign to the individual. Now, to be honest with you, it would depend on where it was. I mean, uh, if it was an embarrassing spot, I probably wouldn't want my face shown. There are people that don't want their face shown. There are people that want uh, their voices disguised. We have done uh, (laughs) television shows of that nature. And there are people that don't want to be uh, on TV or have uh, anything mentioned that might give anybody a clue as to what they are. Now, they have, they, you know, sometimes have uh, occupational hazards because uh, they're afraid that, uh, you know, uh, even scientists pray to uh, hire masters. Uh, they, they don't want to lose their income or be embarrassed or called a nutcase or whatever uh, 
uh, might happen. So uh, they're just we don't we respect that and we don't uh, we don't use them, but we do uh, keep the data and the data is available to the world because I'm not doing this for myself. I'm not doing it for fun and I'm not making a buck. I'm I'm broke as it could be, especially after going through this illness. But uh, you know, through the help of some very kind people, including someone we both know, and I'm going to give him credit on the air, which which is Robert Bigelow, was uh, hey real. Robert, yay yeah, yeah, Robert, yes, what a guy! Just a wonderful, wonderful, kind uh, person who uh, is totally responsible for getting this information out to the world. And uh, you know, when I was ill, he was just uh, absolutely wonderful. Robert so, is uh, a uh, very, very good friend of mine, Roger, and uh, you know the work he's doing now. He's solidly now into aerospace and launching satellites like crazy and getting ready to put a hotel in space. Absolutely. And uh, he deserves it. This is something that he worked for. This has been a goal of his for many, many years since uh, he established uh, NIDS, uh, which uh, helped me greatly with uh, the research. I also understand historically that he had purchased a radio station in the Union Plaza Hotel where a very strange show began with a very famous person now by the name of Art Bell. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. He's really special. Do you know what he did? He actually, um, a, a few years ago, landed a helicopter in my backyard. That was quite an affair, boy. I'll tell you what. Yeah, I'm, the <laughs> dust that came up when that thing landed. Landed a hotel in my backyard, flew myself and my wife uh, into Vegas, and we got a real inside look at satellites preparing to launch the whole assembly facility there. Oh, God, it was incredible. So he's done years of work since then. I guess it's about time for me to have Robert back on the air. Um, yeah. All right. Well, all right I, back I, now, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just uh, going to say, I suggested to uh, your um, uh, program producer, Paul, that... Um, I would like to see uh, Robert back on the air because, uh, you know, like you mentioned, he was, he's in a wonderful position right now. He's going to do some firsts in space that uh, have never been done before in cooperation with uh, a few other people who are making headlines. But Bob always seems to stay, you know, out of the current. You don't see his name in the news. You do see these other guys. but uh, I know. Not, you, know not, who, uh, you know who he reminds me of, Roger? Uh, uh, I, I know who you're going to say, probably you? Howard Hughes. No, 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 no. Although there, there's reason to make that comparison, but no. No, he reminds me of the billionaire in contact. The one who's on the screen to Jodie Foster and leans down and looks into the camera and says, Want to take a ride? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Absolutely true. So uh, he's he's been uh, as I, as I said, uh, most of the things you know. Let let let's you know, talk about the truth. Most of the things that have happened in in ufology that have made uh, uh, books and and comments uh, for all kinds of television and radio shows uh, have been sponsored by Bob Bigelow. That's right. Uh, you know, I was shocked to find out that the Rockefeller event that occurred years and years and years ago. Well, Rockefeller did pay for some of that. He paid for a quarter of it. Bob paid mm -hmm. the rest. Yep. I so, know I, he's behind a lot of research, serious, serious and expensive research in ufology. Yeah, absolutely. He's, you know, one of the people uh, on the face of this planet that is responsible for a number of different things. Now, there are a lot of other people getting on the bandwagon at the present time because I believe finally... The world is waking up to a new reality. Now, we've got Stephen Bassett, for example, who did the um, the citizens' hearing in Washington, D.C., five days long of testimony. I was there. I was on the last day, which was a lucky thing for me. 
because I got to hear what everybody else said, so right, I knew right. I knew the way to go. But uh, you know, it was an intense, very, very intense feeling to uh, sit there and uh, relate this information to uh, you know eighty years or sixty years of uh, congressional. Um, uh, abilities that these these uh, the panel had, and uh, you know to get to get to know them through the years, and I, I learned you know probably as much about the government of the United States as uh, they learned about ufology. <laughs> All right, uh, when we get back, we're going to turn to specifics. Uh, Doctor Roger Lear, hang in there, and we'll be right back from the high desert. And the great American Southwest. This is Dark Matter, raging in the nighttime, exclusively on Sirius XM3. Now, once again, Dr. Roger Lear. Dr. Lear, we've got a subscriber base on XM of around 27 million people. That's a bunch of people. And, you know, a lot of them haven't ever heard my program before. I had Whitley on about, I don't know, within the month. And um, we all know, uh, I know anyway, Whitley had an implant attempted to be removed from his ear. And uh, there are those who doubt what Whitley says. I'm not one of them because I know the man really well. But uh, you were part of the team that tried to remove that implant from Whitley's ear. Am I right? Uh, partially right. I uh, met the physician who uh, was the guy that tried to uh, remove it from the uh, ear. And uh, had quite a conversation with him. And uh, I listened to his uh, explanation of what he saw, uh, how he panicked when it moved out of the way. I would. And In other words, when the scalpel when the scalpel came near, to be clear, the surgeon says the implant actually moved in Whitley's ear. Yes, that's correct. It moved out of the way, but it, he he was able to get a little piece of it. Uh, which was uh, sent in for pathology, and uh, there was some mysterious uh, material, but uh, there wasn't enough there to really uh, make a determination what it was. And then later, uh, Whitley uh, wanted me to uh, take another shot at it, and uh, I said, well, you know, if that's what you want to do, uh, and you're 100% sure, I'll, I'll do it. And then he said, can you guarantee me that after it's done, I won't be dead. And I said, uh, no. That's a stopper. Yep. That's a showstopper. So I, I, re I remember, I remember, maybe you can tell me why doctors do this, uh, Dr. Lear, but uh, when we had Asia, when my wife was in labor, actually, you know, the doctor had been telling her it was a C-section, and the doctor had been telling her every visit when we'd go, you know, for the normal checkup, everything is fine, everything is great, it'll be a C-section, piece of cake, nothing to it. And then when you're actually in the hospital, you're in the bed, you're in the middle of labor, the doctor stands at the end of the bed and says, I, I need to read you this list of risks. And, and there's this long list of, well, you might stop breathing, you might die. And... Um, you know, it's like a showstopper. Of course, in that case, you can't stop the show, but... My goodness, they wait until the last moment to redo the risks. Well, that's not right, because you're supposed to have that list all done and signed uh, before you ever uh, plunk your fanny in the bed. Well, she might have done that. She might have signed and not exactly known. You know, I mean, well, you get a lot of papers you have to sign. <laughs> really not too good bedside manner to, uh, I suppose I went to an ophthalmologist and I was going to have a cataract done and uh, I signed all the stuff and at the last moment he says, well, uh, this procedure is just an ordinary procedure. We've done thousands of them, but uh, yes. you could wind up blind. Yes, that's right. So anyway, Whitley said, you can't guarantee me I won't die. And you said, no. And that, that stopped that. So yeah, uh, so but he, it's still it's still in his ear. It still moves. Uh, at least it was the last time I talked to him. But uh, he, you know, I can't make that kind of a guarantee. Uh, you know, Lord knows what could happen. Uh, we don't we don't know what's going to happen uh, from day to day. If you never touch his ear or, or whatever, especially you if know, you got I, carried it, carried away, I guess, and began chasing it around his head. 
yeah, he yeah, he was actually telling me he had a meet, a meeting with uh, one of his publishers, and uh, it got bright red and hot. He had to run out and go to the restroom and put some uh, cold water on it to cool it off. Uh, that, so, actually, uh, that's it's not that funny. I have seen his ear turn red. I've seen it myself. Yeah, he, he showed it to me one time too when it was uh, glowing beautifully red. You know, I so wanted, I wanted to, not 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 to change gears, but I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, a few people. One is Keith Rowland, who did a wonderful job of getting the immense amount of material I put up on the website uh, up in time for the show. And uh, next week, I, well, I, I didn't get a chance to thank you for the great wonderful, marvelous, fantastic uh, quote that you gave me that we used in uh, on the back of the book, I believe, for um, a UFO crash in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that was just uh, something that I will uh, always I will always thank you for for the rest of my life. Oh, thank you. Uh, and you're right about that. There's a very great deal of photography up on the website, uh, and you can follow along, folks, by going to artbell.com. Just find the name Roger Lear. He's our only guest listed with a human name. Um, and uh, click on that, and then you'll you'll come to the material here, uh, which we're about to talk about. So you might as well get it on the screen, along with so much else to watch up there. Now, um, I, I I'm not sure where to begin. Um, I guess I guess I'll leave it to you. There there's so much material that we have to go through. But uh, you know, I'm right at the first picture. 4.59 a.m., May 15th of 2009, and I'm, I guess I'm looking at something that was taken out of somebody, or what, what am I seeing? Well, I believe if you're seeing a date, uh, you're probably looking at a UFO, and uh, that's probably part of the material from the uh, Combergus uh, Turkey UFO, which showed up three years in a row. I just happened to be there. Uh, and looking through the camera when that was filmed. So there's a large amount of material uh, on that UFO. Now, the camera we were using uh, was a camera with a 300-millimeter lens and an electronic doubler. That means that you can double it to 600 millimeters. Uh, Let me explain what the situation was at the time. Uh, There were three conferences that went on uh, each year. And uh, following the conference, the, the, during the conference, let's look, look go back, uh, UFOs were passing over the uh, conference center uh, like looking at the traffic on a freeway. Where was and this? This was in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Right, okay. Um, just to give you some idea, Doctor, when I look at this photograph, it could either be a large object far away or it could have been something you removed from somebody's ear. In other words, in the first two photographs, there is no uh, reference for size. Right. It was uh, when we get farther into it, you'll see the estimates of our. This was taken out over the sea, uh, and it was uh, from the uh, European coast. So. Um, the investigations that were done on the video gave us, you know, maybe it might have been uh, 20 miles away. Wow. Uh, also, the the uh, the sky was clear, but the moon was bright, and the craft was being lit by the moon. Uh, however, if you go down to the following pictures, you'll see that uh, as we push closer and closer and closer on the craft, we can see that uh, the front end of it is rounded. Oh, my. Has oh my. I, I'm, I'm looking at the video now. Oh, my. Oh, my it's... is right, because this has got to be. And after you've looked at the whole thing, I'm sure you're going to agree. This has got to be the finest footage that was ever taken of a UFO. <sighs> Not only that, but it shows the occupants. I I think I see them. Um, I have a question right away, if you don't mind. My God, that's incredible. I'm running the video right now. That really is incredible. What is it, uh, Dr. Lear, that, that, that lights up the craft uh, or puts a light on the craft? Can you tell me? It kind of comes and goes. 
the, yeah, the, the craft is being lit uh, from the outside. Now, the camera is on a tripod, but there is a slight wind blowing. And the camera uh, is, is focused on the front of the craft, but the craft does move. And then you'll see that in uh, one of the shots there, it kind of turns sideways. And although from the front of it, it looks like it's saucer shaped, you'll see it's not. It's wow. Uh, kind of, it's a wow. Kind of boomerang. I- yeah, I'm sorry. It is definitely a wow. This is really good stuff. Uh, you want to click on the video, folks, and just sort of let it run in the background as we're talking. Um, and I do think it looks like you can see two occupants in what would be some kind of cockpit, right? Right. It's uh, There's three ports that show, one in the middle and one on either end. Now, as you get farther down into the video, and you get uh, not the video, but when you get down into the stills, and we get to the analysis part, the analysis on this video was done by the University of Istanbul, wow. which is a government university, and uh, it created a stir in uh, all the newspapers, national newspapers in Turkey. All I should hope. I, I should hope to give a cow. I'm I'm sitting here watching this now, as I hope a lot of the audience is, and. Wow. Um, this is, and, and the other thing is, this is going on while you're at a UFO conference in Turkey. That's right. This is right after the conference My ended. Goodness. We went down the European coast to the small town called Comburgas, and uh, we stayed up from uh, midnight till five o'clock in the morning, uh, oh. filming out over the sea. And uh, in, in one instance, this was three years in a row. I think it was the last year. I'm not 100 percent sure. I think it was the last year, 2009. Uh, Jaime Masson and his crew were there, and they were filming it also. Uh, so there was two sets of uh, original videos that were taken of this. Now, Jaime had analysis done in Mexico. Um, uh, Hatan Agodan, who's the head of uh, Sirius TV and, uh, or, excuse me, Sirius UFO organization in Turkey, had the analysis done by the University of Istanbul, and then. It went to uh, a fellow, uh, Mario Valdez, in Chile, who used a frame splitter. Now, for those of uh, the audience that's listening, a frame splitter splits each picture that goes by the television camera lens into two what we call fields. Now, the, the, the film goes by the lens at 30 frames per second. So when you split it in half, you get 60 frames per second. So he studied each individual field, and he his concentration was on the occupants of the craft. And you're going to see uh, when you click on the investigation part of this, uh, his entire report is there, and he has made specific uh, outlines and drawing uh, drawings of what these entities were doing while we were filming them. Holy moly! This is such clear stuff. Um, was it just basically hovering out over the ocean in one place, or was there much movement associated with it? Because to you know keep the camera on it at this distance, it must have been relatively stationary. It was relatively stationary, but uh, for whatever the reason, it did make slight turns to one direction and then slight turns to the other direction, because sometimes you're getting a better view of the uh, port that's on the left side. Sometimes you're getting a better view of the port that's on the right side. And then finally it turns sideways, and you can see that it's not a disc. But, you know, uh, remember Bill McDonald? Oh, sure. Well, Bill McDonald, you know, made a drawing of what they considered the Roswell craft to look like. And, boy, if this doesn't uh, fit that drawing, you know. Oh, it, uh, it sure does. It's a definite boomerang shape. And uh, it's also got significant. There, there's two different shots. One where you've got the thing strobing lights all over the place like crazy. And right. then many shots where it's not strobing lights like that. Right. And, you know, why, what are they doing, what's their intent? 
uh, we've had uh, a few people that tried to debunk it and say that, oh, this was nothing but the reflection of lights uh, from oh, uh, a, a thick source on the water oh, and, please. And, and stuff like that. We had one the other day that got me through the website, and he said he's a video analyst, and this has been photoshopped because uh, oh. you can see where the uh, 009, uh, when you analyze it, looks like it's below the other well, in the first place, I wrote him back and I said, you know, uh, I thank you for the time that you took for your analysis. But uh, number one, please give me your credentials. And uh, number two, please tell me where you got a copy of the original film from, because there's only two copies in the world. With that, I never heard from him again. Well, I'm about six, um, six minutes and 40 seconds into it. This is astounding stuff, folks. Wow. Um, what a good lens. I mean, that thing's way out there. And when you get the camera just right, you're able to get very close to it. Wow. That's yeah, really now we, something. We, we surveyed the whole area before we ever filmed anything. We looked for oil derricks. We looked for other platforms, light sources, ships, uh, reflective objects. And there was nothing. I mean, there was nothing out over the water. Now, I don't know if you saw the part yet, but there was a dog standing there on the beach. I looking at the object, and he's just barking his barker off. Uh, yes, yes, I, I saw, absolutely saw it. That's a, well, that's just a remarkable video, and I don't know why it's the first time that I've ever seen it. Well, I was out of the country, and now I'm down to the still photographs, which, wow. These, uh, I guess, are frame grabs? Is that what I'm looking at? Yes, these are frame grabs. Holy smokes. Uh, the one uh, June 8th, 2008. Now, that's a year, nearly a year before the other one, right? That's correct. They were, uh, excuse me. Speaking of dogs. <laughs> Speaking of dogs, yeah. <laughs> you talk about dogs barking on the beach. You see, they, these are so smart that they, uh, you know, talking back to me. <laughs> uh, so, in anyway. other words, th this craft had been visiting this area for quite a long time. Well, now, I discussed this uh, with uh, one of our physicists, and he came up with a very interesting approach. Why did it show up just about the same time for three years in a row at the same time of the night, really? Really? at the same place, at the same geographical location? And he said this might be an indication of time travel. And what we're looking at might be a time loop. Wow. And he said, uh, uh, All right, I, I have a question, uh, an obvious question, I guess. If this craft had been showing up night after night after night in the same place, time loop or not, and that's something we can talk about, why wouldn't a uh, local military have sent something out to try and figure out what was violating their airspace? Uh, in Turkey, that's kind of a strange situation because uh, in Turkey, there's so many UFOs that unless they interfere somehow with human activity, uh, no military force goes up, no, no police helicopters, no nothing. No, nobody does anything. It's so common. You can read about it in the newspapers. Uh, you can hear about it on a television show. It's not that exciting. It's like you were talking about the 18-wheel rig. You know, if it was an 18-wheel rig and it was a 1941 model, uh, that, that might create uh, some great, uh, you know, <laughs> news. But uh, when, you, when you're in a country where it's so open, now they have had instances, for example, in Turkey, uh, there was two instances where uh, commercial airlines uh, became so close to uh, uh, circular craft a saucer-shaped craft on landing uh, that they became dangerous, and their version of the FAA, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was really Double. worried about it. Now that that did cause uh, some uh, military and uh, commercial uh, stir, you know. Uh, well, you you did mention Jaime Mason, and you know what? Down in Mexico, it it also got so common. In fact, they actually had a couple of, I believe, collisions between UFOs and commercial aircraft but it got so common 
in Mexico that otherwise it was like almost like part of daily life or something. Oh, yes. You know, that occurred uh, after the eclipse. It was, you know, like every day. And the same way in Brazil. Brazil, I've been there, uh, I don't know, at least 12 times. And uh, the uh, it's so common in Brazil. It's the only country I know of in the world where you can pick up a tour guide and they tell you where to go see UFOs. Do you have any thoughts, um, Doctor, on why these other countries are so frequently visited? Uh, we had our Phoenix Lights, but I mean, other than that, in recent years, there hasn't been much here compared to, say, Turkey or, um, well, gee, Mexico and South America. And any thoughts on why? Well, yeah, I, I do. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we think that uh, we're not as visited as much as these other countries, but that's because the cloak of secrecy is so strong here mm -hmm. right. that when people talk about it, report it or whatever, it never goes anywhere. There yes. is a blackout on this information, and this is what we were trying to do with the citizens' hearing. <laughs> and it's it's my hope. Now, I just was uh, served on a committee with uh, Senator Gravel again for, uh, you had uh, James Fox on for 710, and I was supposed to be in that film, but because of a mix-up, something happened at the last minute, I wasn't in it. But just the, the night before the filming, I was with Senator Gravel, and they are pushing forward. And I think this is really going to happen. We're going to get a hearing before the General Assembly of the United Nations. Really? I believe so. Uh, they've got, uh, he's got a very powerful uh, group in Washington, and he's uh, donated a uh, corporation to the cause, which is a nonprofit, 501c3. And uh, it looks like he's got the contacts and the ability to raise the money to get this done. So it's, and it's not just him. It's uh, Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Kirkpatrick uh, with uh, several of the other members of the committee that were there, too, that are all for getting this done. And uh, you, sh you should have heard be the difference between their opening statements and their closing statements. I mean, they said they were, uh, you know, open. But after five days of testimony from nine to five every day, uh, listening intently to what everybody had to say, uh, they went, you know, I'm sure 180 degrees. And they came out and said, you know, this, this, this is not a U.S. problem. This, this is a, a situation which is worldwide. So, you know, we're not going to get. You know, we're not going to get the representation from Congress, but uh, Steve Bassett is uh, still under the opinion that if we uh, drive I know he's hard plugging enough, away. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's plugging away. He's plugging away. And uh, he's, you know, fortunately been able to uh, raise the money outside the country to do things like this. So these, these events are tremendous, and they're tremendously expensive. Okay, when... Uh you know what? Let's let's take our break here and pick up on the other side. I want to talk a little bit about that time thing. The possibility that it was movement in time again and again and again. All right. Dr. Roger Lear is here. He is a, a surgeon. He removes alien implants from people. The... Uh, I, I can't believe it. I keep getting these messages on the wormhole saying, Art... Where's the video? I can't find the video. Oh, please. Go to artbell.com. Look, uh, scroll down a little bit for the name Dr. Roger Lear, scheduled for today. Then click on his name. First, you'll see some still photographs. Then you will see the video in question. It's a little better than, I think it's about six minutes, 40 seconds, something like that. And this is really good stuff. And, uh, you know, again, Dr. Lear said it came back over a very long period of time and suggested uh, that perhaps it was some sort of time loop, which is interesting. Um, if it were some sort of time loop, then one would imagine or guess that it might not actually physically be there. And yet it was able to be photographed, video, both video and still photographs. So... A time loop 
uh, doctor, you think uh, you really think that's possible? It's fascinating. Well, that's what uh, you know. A lot of my material doesn't come from me because uh, I really don't consider myself a scientist. Uh, you know, I do have uh, degrees in you know medical biology and so on, right. but um, I'm not a, a PhD um, a material specialist. You know, I, I don't have degrees in physics and so on. But we have uh, four uh, nuclear physicists now on the board of uh, NS Research. Uh, the latest one came out of the citizens hearing, Dr. Tom Ballone, who had the ability to uh, put up a formula at, at the hearing on two giant television screens, a formula for uh, zero-point energy. There it is. Really? I mean, we, we were looking at it. The Congress people were looking at it. Everybody was looking at it. There it is. He says, this, this is a formula. Uh, so, you know, these are the kind of people that uh, I respect their opinion. So someone comes to me and said, uh, perhaps, perhaps, why you're getting this around the same time of the year, three years in a row, is that these entities have the ability for time travel. Now, they, they could have been doing this uh, for a specific reason. Uh, you know, they obviously know our history. They certainly know a lot about uh, human beings, the anatomy, physiology, psychology. There seems to be a few things that uh, certain numbers of races uh, that are non-terrestrial uh, don't know, that they're still learning about us. Uh, David Jacobs with his uh, hybrid uh, program, I agree that they are making hybrids, but I unfortunately don't agree that that's the only thing that's being uh, accomplished by the abduction phenomena. Well, you brought but, up the name uh, Dr. Jacobs, so I'm, I really have to ask you, there's a great argument in ufology about whether these beings are friendly or not friendly, foe. And uh, Dr. Jacobs, by and large, believes that they are not friendly at all. I wonder if you buy into that, or how do you feel about it? I can't take science and agree with that opinion because if they were not friendly, why would we be even here having this conversation? And now one of our nuclear physicists, Dr. Robert Koontz, is an ex-naval physicist and with a background that's a mile long. I, I didn't send that along because it's just too much material, and perhaps we can talk about it another time. But sure. uh, he uh, he's one of the physicists that's on our board, and he has made uh, mathematical calculations based on the isotopes that are in the implant objects uh, as to their relationship to the Big Bang theory. In other words, if we take, take the date of the Big Bang, he can calculate a constant, which he can use in a formula. And he, he figured out mathematically two things, which have been so far not disputed, that the elements that we're finding in these objects, these isotopes, come from one-third away across the Milky Way galaxy. Wow. From, from a civilization which he says is 80 to 100 million years older than we are. How are they able to make that determination? It's all uh, with advanced uh, mathematics, uh, it, and it boils down to basically how uh, Uncle Stan Friedman can say, um, if you live in New Jersey, you don't go to the Bronx to uh, buy your bread. So if the materials come from a certain area, then you can tell by how long it took the change from one isotope to a next element how long it took to get there, and you can figure out the age of the civilization. That's the best as I am able to explain it. It's much more complex. So again, I have to take the word of a, a noted world-renowned physicist. Okay. Um, how, with respect to the uh, implants that have been removed and tested, how many of them have actually shown um, isotopes that would lead a person away from Earth? 
Well, we've done uh, 16 cases, removed two, uh, uh, 17 objects, and you were correct in your summation in the beginning. Uh, one of them did have two. Now, in the early days of research, and this is probably what I was talking about so many years ago, the first test that uh, came from uh, Los Alamos uh, uh, laboratories in the Mexico Tech compared them to a meteorite sample. So uh, we've gone a long, long, long way since the, those days because uh, science, our science, has advanced also. We, we have better machinery, better mechanics. Uh, uh, to give you an instance, um, you, you know, your, your question in relative to, to the numbers of uh, the objects that we removed, how many of them show extraterrestrial uh, properties. Uh, we know that most of them are showing extraterrestrial properties, but we don't know until we look. So uh, now we're able to take advantage of going back to what we have left of the original objects right. and looking at them again. Uh, to give you an example, uh, a scanning electron microscope, which uses a uh, high voltage, uh, a kilovoltage, to put out an electron beam, and then the electron beam can give us pictures at various depths through uh, a material object. Uh, years ago, when we, we started doing this, at, let's say uh, 10,000 kilovolts, you were able to get maybe 100,000 times magnification. If you went higher than that, you'd get what's called scattering, which is just a bunch of uh, electrons bouncing all over the place, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't get a decent picture. Now, with uh, 10,000 kilovolts, you can get uh, magnifications of around five to uh, 600,000 times. You go up to 20,000 uh, 20, kilovolts, and you can get uh, very close to a million magnification. We can get down things now to uh, looking at one atom. And that's one of the things that we see in these objects are apertures that are only one atom wide. The next thing that we've found, and I'm kind of getting ahead of the game here, but uh, are carbon nanotubes, uh, both single-walled and, and double-walled carbon nanotubes. Whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. You're, you're, you're saying some of these implants contain, contain carbon nanotubes? That's correct. And eight years, nine years ago, uh, academic scientific community was arguing whether a carbon nanotube could even exist. That's because correct. it doesn't exist in nature, and you can't make it. It can't be done. Well, here they are. And now our ob objects, you know, one of them, when we took it out, was uh, 42 years old. <laughs> right, you know, exactly good. right way ahead of anything we could have done anywhere near that time, but probably even now. Yeah, you could dump wow. all the money in the black budget. We're in uh, projects in the world, and you wouldn't have come up with a carbon nanotube, but these go far, far more uh, uh, complex than uh, what uh, is even talked about today, because you can build a single wall you know, a tube, but you can also build a double wall. That's what we find. And then let's compare it to, to those that don't understand what a carbon nanotube is. It's a carbon atom, which is connected to another carbon atom, and it forms a chain, which is in a circle. And then you extend this chain, and you get a chain of carbon nanotubes. Uh, 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 atoms, and this is a carbon nanotube. So you can double the wall, and you can have twice the thickness, but there's a hole in the center, and the hole in the center can be what we call dope with uh, other material. For example, one of the uses today that they're talking about medically is to put, uh, let's say, an antibiotic or an anti-cancer agent, let's look at that way, into a small carbon nanotube, and that's called doping, and then you inject that into a malignant tumor, and the uh, carbon nanotube then releases the anti-cancer drug directly into the tumor, and you don't destroy the surrounding tissue. So uh, there's lots of applications that are being talked about today, but now we can make them, but we can't make them the complex way that we find them uh, in these objects. Now, the other thing is, how do you combine a carbon nanotube into molten metal? No idea. It's an, 
no idea. No one, no one else that <laughs> has any idea either. But here it is, folks. You know, you look at it, you see it. You know, with new uh, equipment, and uh, these carbon nanotubes are then. You know, if, let's take a wire, for example, uh, without any insulation on it, and you take the wire and you wrap two wires together. You know, and then you you know you continue doing this until you have what a cable, and then right. you throw some insulation on it, and you got an insulated cable. So uh, this is what we find with carbon nanotube technology and these objects. Now, where do they go? They go uh, with a pattern like a circuitry. And remember, we're looking under uh, an electron microscope that's uh, looking at this about 750 to uh, 8, 8, 950 thousand uh, uh, times magnification. And they run into what we call uh, orthorhombic crystals. I know that sounds... Uh, Tremendously right. complex, but it's not way over uh, my head. It's a very, very easy to explain. It's it's a crystal that's a rectangle, simple okay. rectangle. All and right, here's, rectangles... a qu- here's a question for you. Here's a question for you, uh, Doctor. Uh, do you have any knowledge of, or guesses even, how these um, various implants interact or associate with human biology? We have some idea. Uh, we used to think that they were being powered by the nervous system, <laughs> as is UCLA now uh, powering um, small uh, motors to run uh, servos in um, uh, artificial uh, prosthetic devices. Uh, <laughs> but now we've kind of changed our opinion because um, we know that you can broadcast energy. And uh, if you broadcast energy, for example, by use of a scalar wave, you can power these objects remotely. So let's just accept that as a possibility. Uh, The next thing uh, in reference to your question of how it's used in the human body, obviously these things we know are being used to relay information, uh, some kind of data, uh, a data pattern. How do we know that? And what... For example, those who have had the implants, what are they saying? Are they saying, I hear voices, or I have ideas that I don't recognize as my own, or what? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Now here, I'm going to bring it home right in your own backyard. Sure. We have a radio frequency detector, and we've been able to detect radio frequencies coming out of these objects. All right, stop right there. You're finally into an area where I sort of know what I'm talking about. Uh, what what range of frequencies are you talking about, and what kind of uh, emitted signal are you talking about? Uh, they're in the FM band, and I unfortunately don't have the exact figures, which goes out to about a uh, 10-digit number. But they're both in the kilohertz, uh, kilohertz and megahertz range in the FM band. You're talking about the commercial broadcast FM band? <laughs> this is a band uh, I was able to, um, let's see how to put this. I was able to view a secret uh, chart with all the frequencies from every satellite that is uh, circling our planet uh, put up by every country. And these okay. are in a category of fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. Okay, but, but when you're talking about the, the frequency emission from, the, um, from these uh, implants, I mean, we're talking about two different things here. You're talking about a list of frequencies from satellites orbiting Earth or whatever, and I'm talking about the implants themselves apparently transmitting some sort of signal. Is yeah, that yes, yes, okay. they are trans- there's both in the kilohertz and megahertz range. As I said, I don't have the readings. I'd be happy to send them to you. If you might, uh, I would, in- I would very much enjoy that. Um, now, one of the things that we, one of the things we don't have, and uh, you know, we keep trying to get someone to donate this to us, but we have the radio frequency detector, but we don't have a radio frequency analyzer, so we can't capture the wave. 
Oh, you're talking but, about pretty pretty big money here if yeah, you're on an analyzer. Uh, yeah. I know. The new digital ones are quite costly, but I think we could settle for an old analog one. <laughs> so you, so would, if you were to get a donation by somebody, you, you wouldn't be unhappy about that? Not not unhappy at all. We would certainly pass this information right back to the public where it belongs. <laughs> okay. But, uh, um, the other possibility is here, uh, and you got to consider this, uh, no, no matter what radio wave it happens to be, I really agree with Stan Friedman when he talks about SETI as being silly effort to investigate. What advanced civilization, especially when we have a physicist that's telling us these are 80 million years older than uh, we are, are using radio waves to uh, for some kind of a communication or data collection device? That's preposterous. So there's either either two thing, one of two things going on if you look at it logically. Either there's a deal made where the information that's being broadcast from these objects is being received here by some earthly source, uh, and they're tapping into the information that's coming out going somewhere else. It's a piggyback sort of thing. Uh, uh, or what we have is a, again, this is more in your area than mine, so you can probably tell me, uh, scalar wave technology uh, when it comes into our electromagnetic spectrum, we're getting a harmonic that looks like a radio wave, but rarely may not be. Well, that's, we, that's testable. And, I mean, that's we, very testable. And we, and we know that scalar waves are faster than the speed of raw light. And, and Tom Ballone, the physicist in Washington, testified before the committee that this is a way to communicate in deep space. And you don't have to wait for four years to get your answer back. Well, I, I deal in radio waves that go at the speed of light or just uh, touch below it, not with scalar waves. So I don't know a thing about scalar waves. Uh, you're saying they're faster than light. That's correct. I didn't know that had been proven. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's accepted uh, modern uh, technology. Uh, Tom is uh, not only a theoretical, but he's also a mechanical physicist. So uh, the things that he's investigated, uh, he's already done in the laboratory. So when he comes up with these statements, I mean, it's already been done. Well, I wasn't aware of it. I, I was aware that uh, quantum movement uh has certainly if there is communication is faster than light certainly um but i don't know about scalar waves so maybe um so uh, anyway you uh, w where do we move from here where would you like to go from here i know you've got a lot of material up there well um Let's see. I, I, I've told you some of the things that we found uh, in the objects that we've removed with, uh, you know, more modern techniques. <laughs> Let's uh, hit on a few other ones. Uh, some of the things we understand, some of the things we don't understand. And when, when we see the carbon nanotechnology involved with these orthorhombic crystals, uh, we know that crystals, uh, since the beginning of radio, have been a very important uh, device for the receiving of, uh, you know, uh, uh, radio uh, uh, frequencies. Uh, so this is this kind of advanced uh, crystallography, if you want to put it that way. But um, we also see objects that we don't understand. We see gold spheres that are about uh, four to ten atoms uh, in diameter. We, we don't know what they're for. Uh, we find uh, other inclusions of uh, metals that uh, we don't know what they're for. I told you about the one atom apertures. Right. We're, we're, we're not sure what they do. Um, uh, we all right, Dr. Lear, if I, if I can, let me drag you back to the question I asked, and that, that is, and you said it was a good one, what do you know about what these people report, these people who have things in them? Um, are they being told things? Are are they aware of some communication that's being made with them? In other words, I'm looking for some clue to what these things are doing. Okay, I'll let you have it <laughs> for the full bag. 
<laughs> now, sure. scientifically, which is, I like to stay with the scientific approach, uh, opinions, uh, you know, are but, fine. But not all of it has to be. I mean, if people are reporting that these things are controlling them or giving them ideas or communicating in some way, I understand it's not scientific, but I'd love to hear it. Okay, well, we're looking at a different ball game. Uh, number one, uh, why is the abduction phenomena going on in the first place? We have to okay. go back All right. to that. Let's do it. Uh, we know that, uh, and I've been in 42 countries in seven years, so it's relatively the same in the United States as it is in Brazil or in the Middle Eastern countries or in Africa. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, some of the uh, entities that are seen may be a little bit different, but 99%, I would say, of all abduction cases involve the taking of ova and sperm. Now, uh, who is whoever is taking this thing uh, doesn't work for the cooking channel, and they're not making omelets. Okay. Yeah. You know, so uh, obviously, there's you know you've got to theorize there's some kind of a genetic experiment going on. And I don't, so, don't want to hear. About, I don't want to hear about sperm in the cooking channel in the same sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Couldn't resist. But anyway. So there's some genetic experiment going on, and uh, I think it's an experiment, which I partially agree with uh, uh, David Jacobs. I think the human race is being altered, and I can give you a number of instances where this might be a factual scenario that we are witnessing now. Uh, I remember years ago, if you remember John White, who used to put on the conferences in uh, Connecticut? Yes. He coined the term Homo Noeticus, and he right. said that the human race was eventually becoming Homo Noeticus. I think that's what the kids for the last 50 or 60 or 70 years are becoming. Uh, they know things. They know things yep. without You're right. learning. I know. So many people have said this, Doctor, uh, and they're called by various names. But I think it is fair to suggest that many, many children... Uh, currently alive are of a kind of a different uh, what's the right way to say it without offending species. somebody well it's, almost it's, yeah. it's homo sapien becoming homo noeticus it's an advanced civilization <laughs> and all right. All right. I, I think uh, there's a lot of examples you know if you want to look at the world picture uh, All right, uh, Doctor, hold it right there. We're going to take a break. It's going to be about, uh, it's a longer one. It lasts about five minutes or so. So just relax. Let me tell you about the Santa Ally portable speaker. Listen, um, Dr. Lear is a physician, a surgeon, and he removes implants from people and then has them examined. So... This is pretty wild stuff. There's no question about it. I don't know what leads a physician down this path. In fact, we'll ask about that. But I asked him what people report, people who have implants, what they say. Are they being led in a different direction in life? Are they receiving messages? Is it in some way manipulating them? That question hangs. And uh, the moment I asked it, uh, Dr. Lear began talking about uh, Dr. Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs thinks that, um, you know, these aren't friendly beings at all. And he makes a very strong case for it. In fact, we should have him on the air and will. Um, and here's what I have to say, just, just before I bring you back on, Doctor, and that is, what do you think a cow believes? <laughs> In other words, um, as a cow goes through life and is being raised, ultimately, to become a hamburger, it probably thinks the world is a pretty darn friendly place because it's allowed to graze peacefully in the sun, eating. It's brought food frequently. It's certainly given water and nourishment. If it's ill, it's given shots to recover from whatever is bothering it. In other words, the cow is treated, uh, treated pretty darn well right up until the moment that it gets a hammer on the head or however it's done and turned into hamburger. Now, Dr. Uh, Lear, you know, is that where you were going with the Dr. Jacobs comment? Uh, no, 
not really. <laughs> yeah, but there there is an analogy to be fo- something to be followed there. Maybe maybe they are not friendly. Maybe these are not nice gestures at well, all. Well, let, let's go back to the cow. Okay. Uh, the cow is also at one time a calf, correct? Oh yes, yes indeed, yes. And don't we eat veal? Well, yes. So of uh, a cow is not necessarily going to make it through a lifetime where he's going to be le- or she is going to be leisurely grazing in the pasture. He may be eaten by the time he's a kid. Oh, it's true, but but even then, up until that moment, life seems good. Well, life seems good probably to a chicken. Look what we do to a fish. Or, um, uh, let's say, a marine mammal. We pull them out of the water. Yeah, you're making my case, Doctor. You're making my case. Sure. In other words, uh, they may or may not be our friends. And, you know, they they may have a time scale. Well, let's say they're not. Okay. Let's look at how many millions of years we've been allowed to graze. Well, again, they may have a time scale that doesn't quite match up with our clocks. Well... Why not just come here tomorrow? Well, let me put the question to you. Why, why well, wait for tomorrow? Why, why wait? Uh, why wait for tomorrow? Come today. Let's let's do it today. I'm all for it. Maybe. I mean, depending on on what the you know where we're headed when they arrive. Well, I'm I'm more afraid of what we got now here than somewhere from somewhere else. Well, that's a well grounded fear. I would say. Well, the uh, way we're, we're doing going some, is, uh, yeah, is I know, not, I know, not, I know, not the greatest thing in the world. I know, I know. All right. So anyway, again, this question: uh, Have you talked to people who have had the implants and have they had anything to say about the way it is seemingly apparent, you know, apparently affecting their lives, or maybe it isn't at all? That's my point. It is okay. You're, you're hitting, doctor. You're hitting touch tones once in a while by mistake. Excuse me. You're hitting touch tones. You know the uh, tones on your phone by mistake. No, I'm nowhere near the the dial pad. Really? Absolutely not. I'm at least uh, six feet away from it on an extended cord. Damn NSA! What's the matter with those people? All right. Um, well, we'll, we'll let them hear what we have to say. Uh, they're tapping in everything anyway. Anyway, back to uh, where we were as to uh, what is actually being emitted from these uh, objects. I think it's data. And I think the data is uh, that's where we were heading when, before I made the, the comment about omelets. But okay. uh, since if, we, if we agree that uh, it's a possibility... And, and, and again, I, I want to say, and I've said this over, uh, over and over again all over the world, if anybody gets uh, on the air on anybody's program or in a public uh, place, a public forum, and tells you they have all the answers, then uh, my thing is uh, you better put a finger in each ear and run as fast as you can go. Oh, if we you know. have all the answers, I don't even want to talk to you. It's impossible to have all the answers. So I'm afraid that puts people in a specific category that wouldn't be a good interview on the show. Yeah. Well, that's why I kind of like to stay with uh, the scientific approach. There's things that are theoretical, which you're allowed to do, and things that are not. But even things that are theoretical still have to be proven. Right. So uh, okay. we that's know good. that there's data. You know, that we know there's a data stream coming out of these uh, objects. And I believe that the data has to do with the changes in our DNA that uh, are now occurring on a regular basis. Okay, so, so you, don't think it's, you don't think it's going the other way, Doctor. You think the data is outgoing and it's a monitoring sort of thing, uh, not so much incoming and controlling in any way. 100%, because uh, I'll tell you, I've talked to uh, specific cases, a lady, for example, in Brazil that had an object, and she was told by uh, the folks that put it in not to have it removed. And uh, she asked them if it was a locating device, and they just uh, uh, showed her a, a bug that they stopped in a beam of light in midair. And we said that we can track this bug 
anywhere on this planet that we need to track it, and it doesn't need a device. And then uh, shortly after that, I heard uh, from uh, some of the leading geneticists that we now know that uh, all DNA, whether it's human or animal or whatever, all DNA contains its own specific electronic signature. So all you have to do then is be smart enough to build a device and you can pick out anybody on the entire planet or anything. So they don't they don't need them as tracking devices. Behavior control, um behavior control does not need a device. If you've been deducted, abducted and they look into your eye and they suggest things to you, they can block their memory, they understand the neural network, uh, they know uh, how to okay. place things in your mind, they can make you see your dead relatives or whatever else they want to see, or you, they can make you see them as clowns or whatever. So. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I get I it. Um, I get it. So it's it's all outgoing data, and it probably has something to do with genetics. But they're monitoring, clearly monitoring something. And absolutely. And again, I would ask you what what are they monitoring? And but you wouldn't have that answer, of course. Uh, you could. Well, my answer, answer is that is the change in the genetic manipulation that's going on. Is it a successful manipulation or is it not? Uh, if uh, uh, we know that DNA gives off an electronic signature, it probably gives off information according to the DNA stranding. Uh, 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 isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Well, one would imagine that a DNA change is a painfully slow thing to attempt to monitor unless, unless you're affecting it in some way. So you're suggesting there's an abduction, there's a change made, and then they're monitoring that change with that device. Right on the nail's head. Okay. Now, Oof. I want to I want to uh, modify that by saying you know, we yeah, I I've got thousands of abductee cases and um, a lot of them see grays. The typical, you know, bumper sticker, black-eyed graves. Right, right. A lot of the things like what we looked at in the Comburgus footage, by the way. Um, so anyway, we see these graves and we look at them and we lump them all into one group. Because we're not astute enough to know that one set of grays may come from Zeta Reticuli and another set of grays may be us, uh you know, 100,000 years in the future. So we don't know one from the other. We we look at, uh, uh, you know, for people of uh, skin color from uh, various countries, and to Caucasians, they all look the same. Can't mm -hmm. tell the difference. So we group them all at one, into one group. Uh, so when you say grays, I think that's a misnomer, too, because there may be grays, you know, 20 different races of grays visiting here. Maybe they don't all have the same uh, uh, procedures that they're doing. Maybe it's only a certain group that's doing abductions. Maybe Jacob, uh, David Jacobs is 100% uh, on when he says there's a group that's making hybrids. I, I, I don't argue with that at all. All I'm saying is that the situation is so complex that the greatest possibility is that there's a number of things going on at the same time in relation to the field of alien abduction. Mm -hmm. Well, it what you've said does make sense uh, in terms of abduction, implant, monitoring. Uh, just basically what we would do, I guess, and... Gee, that kind of brings up another subject. Um, there are many people, Doctor, who say this is all some kind of big cover, and it's our own government, God help us, doing these things to us. Uh, and your reaction to that is? Uh... I don't. I, I believe you know that that sixty-three trillion dollars has been spent on the black budget accumulated total. I believe that, uh, but um, 
I also believe that uh, when it's said that they may be 100 years ahead of academic technology, uh, I, I think that could very well be the case, too. I think that we may be, we may be flying in space somewhere around our solar system, but I don't think we've left it. So uh, we do have some advanced technology. In fact, Senator Gravel uh, in this he hearing admitted you know, in, in front of the, the witnesses and all the other people that were there and on, on streaming vi video, that we have our own space fleet. Now that's well, that was quite a you know admission coming from government. It certainly is. You know, um, I guess he actually said that he, he believed that was the case. He th yeah. thinks it could be the case, or uh, what? that is the case, and you that can. Is the uh, case. Yeah, if you go into the archive, and I think it's still up on uh, the citizens' hearing, you can uh, get to the place where he makes uh, that statement. Wow. So uh, do do we uh, have the abilities to uh, do these things? I think to a certain extent, but, you know, uh, just like when, when the, the, entity, the object that went over your head, you know, you could say, well, maybe that was uh, some secret military thing, or maybe it was from somewhere else. But when you take uh, the Phoenix situation and you have people reporting that one wingtip is over one mountain range and the other wingtip is over another mountain range, right? I don't think that's from here. All right. Uh, there's great argument about this um, everywhere I go, and that is. Whether or not the White House, the president, actually, has knowledge of extraterrestrial presence here, or whether this is the kind of thing kept from presidents, or just some presidents. Ah, what a wonderful and timely question, really? because I, I have my little pointer here on the website, artbell.com. And uh, if uh, the folks uh, would click on the OSTP report given to President Obama, uh, they will see a surprising document that answers your question in its entirety. Where, where is it? Where is it? Now I'm the one saying, where is it? I'm, I'm in your photographs, your pictures. Is that okay. where I need to be or... No, you've got to Where? click on the uh, OSTP report, which is uh, before that. Okay. Okay, show references, images for dark matter, Comburgus turkey UFO, full image analysis shows occupants, and right below it is OSTP report. Okay, got it, got it, got it. I've got it. Um, so you click on that, you'll see it says Black Vault, and then the um, Executive Office of the President, Office of Science Technology Policy. And this is dated March the 22nd, 2011, and you can see that uh, certain names have been uh, redacted, and this is in response to uh, John Greenwald, who now has a huge number of documents on the Black Vault. He's the one that procured this for me. And uh, the article is written by uh, James C. Kallenberger, who is the head of this committee. And uh, if you go down uh, the report uh, and uh, enlarge it, it makes it easier to see, you'll see that there's an entire report on me and the work that uh, we have done with the um, implants and how this was done at a time when uh, Mr. Obama was um, looking for funds for his national health care plan. And, uh, for example, uh, it says, uh, for uh, just the facts, UFO investigators Lear and Mosier. Mosier is one of the uh, scientists that uh, was previously on our board offer uh, uh, compelling news of uh, 2009 ex-conference press conference, hard evidence uh, that uh, can be analytical and, and results um, uh, point towards the uh, non-human origin of the devices. So uh, it, it, this, the president, President Obama, is it uh, in the White House? Uh, you bet your bottom dollar. All right. Um, dummy me doesn't have Adobe Reader loaded, so I'm doing that. 
So he knows exactly what's going on. Exactly. Uh, And uh, if you want me to add a little more icing to this cake, when I um, arrived the first day at the citizens' hearing, I was met by uh, Senator or uh, Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Kilpatrick, who grabbed me by the sleeve and took me aside and said, uh, "There is someone who would uh, that's here that would like to talk to you for a few minutes if you have time." So uh, I said, well, of course. She didn't tell me who it was, and I had my assistant, uh, Linda, with me. And so uh, we were, this was at the press club, so she took me down to the bottom floor. We went to the little restaurant there, and as we noticed, uh, when we walked in the door, there were some uh, very large uh, black folk, uh, very well-dressed in suits, uh, with a curly Q wire going into their ears, talking to their wrists. And uh, we then were led around the corner to kind of a private area where there was a table set up. And uh, who was sitting at the table but none other than uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan. Wow. Now, Minister Louis Farrakhan had invited me and several other guests uh, a few years back to uh, lecture to the Muslim nation about UFOs. And he's been teaching for years. Uh, his following that the UFOs are the wheels of Ezekiel in the Bible. So when we started uh, giving out the uh, information on ufology, of course, mine was on uh, the abduction uh, situation and implants. I didn't know what the audience knew or what they didn't know. But it turned out they knew just about as much as someone that was sitting in the audience of a UFO conference. (laughs) <laughs> and it was amazing. And he jumped up from the table. Uh, he was on the telephone. And I, I heard him say, uh, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, I will get back to you soon. So uh, he got up and he came over with a very friendly greeting and told me how nice it was for, for uh, me to be there and for him to see me again. And I was uh, uh, very excited about the whole situation it was totally unexpected and so on and then he got a call from the mayor of Chicago and excused himself and went back to the table and we went to the hearing well two days later I found out from uh, an excellent source um, that uh, Mr. Obama was uh, in residence at the White House uh, during the time of the hearing and that the person that uh, Mr. Farrakhan hung up on to excuse himself to talk to me was President Obama. Okay. So um, does does the White House know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've got a, a follow-up question. If we assume, uh, for the sake of argument, that the the president absolutely knows, or that, that all presidents have known for some time now, what rationale would the people who told the president about extraterrestrial president, uh, presence, uh, what rationale would they be able to present to the president to keep that information from the American people? Well, again, uh, we're talking about theoretical opinion, and it's my theoretical opinion that the majority of information on ufology has now passed from government, U.S. government, or any of the other government control into the hands of uh, huge, giant, corporate world monopolies. These are industries. And uh, I found out something also at the hearing I thought was quite interesting. That was the Eisenhower speech where he warned about the military-industrial complex. Of course, yes. Uh, I I found out from a very, very reliable source uh, on the committee that, that that speech was changed five minutes before Eisenhower gave it. And, and it should have read. Know what it, it should have read what? It should have read the military congressional military complex. 
<clears throat> military congressional military complex, complex. right complex. well it was pretty startling um just the way it was frankly um but again let's pretend i'm president obama all right and you're the one who's told me this information and i'm saying look here i want to speak to the american people i want to tell them the truth what would you say to me well, if I was in a position uh, to say anything, you know, who am I to tell the president anything? Because all the information on is the so-called need-to-know basis. So oh. does, the, does yeah, this particular... But, yeah, but for the sake of this conversation, Doctor, you've got to pretend to be the person who absolutely has to convince me that this information cannot be given to the American people because they're not ready or whatever. Uh, I, I would tell you that, uh, number one, that uh, it is not in the uh, interest of this nation's security to give you this information uh, because um, of the uh, advanced nature of uh, what is going on. And that's about all that I'm going to tell you. Oh, my goodness. The, 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 right. the security of the, com- the country. Well, then I'm just going to go on TV. I'm going to get a prime spot and I'm going to tell the American people everything and we'll be right back. Okay, I'm going to open the lines now. Go ahead and open the lines and let's start taking some calls for Dr. Leah. Uh, When you think about it, this is a pretty significant topic we've got going on here. We've got a physician, surgeon, who's been removing implants from people. Implants that, when they're checked out, have turned out to be a containing matter that is similar to that found in meteorites. In other words, outworldly. Maybe it's just monitoring. Maybe it's uh, monitoring after there has been abduction. Whatever it is, it's... I don't know. It's either good or it's really bad. I I have no way of knowing, and uh, I, I guess nobody really does until one day when it's all made clear to us, and that may be a good or a bad day as far as humanity is concerned. But if you'd like to call and you have a question, uh, we've got a great phone number. They don't come any better. 855-REAL-UFO. That's 855-REAL-UFO or 855-732-5833. Three, six. So, Doctor, you think that presidents know about all of this and they are told something uh, that uh, prevents them from going on TV and telling everybody. God knows every now and then a president needs something to take the American people's minds off of, you know, whatever political mess they're in at the moment. Right. And yet they don't do it. That's correct. And uh, I think. You know, sometimes I feel sorry for presidents and other leaders of countries because mm. they've lost the control. Uh, this this country is, you know, our own country is not uh, functioning now as it was set up to be, as our forefathers, I'm sure. That I don't have to tell you the uh, implications of that. Uh, but... Uh, you know, they, they they try, and I'm, some of them are maybe very sincere in doing the job that they're doing, but uh, without the information, it's just, they're just like scientists who say, uh, you know, I can't discuss this because uh, I might lose my job. Uh, or number two, look at the, we had one day of uh, sworn uh, uh, testimony from uh, military witnesses an entire day at the hearing. Oh, yes. In which oh, yes. They, they testified they had to sign uh, oaths of uh, secrecy. And uh, another thing that uh, our audience might be interested in, in knowing, and I didn't know it, I learned as much there as maybe they did. Uh, but uh, I found out that um, they told us that these uh, oaths that are taken of secrecy are not um, oaths to the organization for which the individual works with. In other words, if they were in the NSA or CIA or military intelligence and they took an oath of secrecy, secrecy that was not an oath that was given to that particular department, but that was an oath to the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States also has the right of regress so that every single one of them 
has the legal right to go before Congress and say, I'm taking it back, I'm taking my word back, and I'm going to tell whoever it is that I want to tell. And there's nothing that can be done about it. It takes a lot of guts to do that. Take, yep, takes a lot of guts. But, you know, look at the people that are now coming forth. Lots and lots of military officers that are still around that have, uh, you know, guilty knowledge, and they're, they're talking about it. So they well, violate, they violate yeah, they, it. There, there's also people who have told things and end up living in Russia because that's the only option they have. Well, there are people who have told things that aren't living anywhere. Another extremely good point, one that we've discussed on this program any number of times. This is something so big that taking a life or lives over it, it, it's, I guess it's not too hard to imagine that, is it, Doctor? Not too hard to imagine at all. When I think of cases like Stanley Meyer and John Mack and a few of the others I know. I, I said that the other day about uh, Professor Mack. You know, people, uh, are you, you, they accept what they're told. He didn't look the right way. Boom, that's the end of that. And it was just at an incredibly, you know, right after the African thing. Yeah. I just, I don't buy it. I don't Dr. buy it Lear. either. He wasn't in poor health. He was in good health. Uh, too much non-suspicion makes me suspicious. Have you ever been in fear for your own life? Uh, no, but that's just me, Art. Uh, uh, I'm getting to be old. You know, I am old. <laughs> I'm getting old and, too. I can hear. I can hear footsteps. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what the heck? I'm gonna. You know, if I'm gonna go out, I'll go out in a blaze of glory. I, I did. Uh, uh, you know, one of the other radio shows uh, one night, and I was. Uh, on a, on a cell phone uh, talking, and uh, I got uh, cut off the air. When I got home, uh, I thought my battery went dead in the phone. The dash lights dimmed in the car, and I got home, to, and the battery wouldn't take a charge, so I took out the, the battery, and it was fried. Yeah, yeah. See, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, I wonder if those sorts of things are served up as warnings. I think so. I think if you uh, stay within the limits or within the boundaries of uh, what they think isn't going to bother the public or the security of, of I'm not going to say the security of the nation, but the security of the greedy few, let me put it that way, that uh, you may be okay. But you, All right. I, I've got another avenue I want to go down here very quickly with you, and that is, look, you just said a few minutes ago that you had shingles a couple hours ago, you had shingles, and it kind of wiped you out financially. Now, you're a physician. Um, you've got to be, one would imagine, making a pretty good living. And my question is this, what in the world, doctor, would cause somebody like yourself who could have a nice, comfortable life, he's a doctor, could be making good money, and just enjoying life and laying back, to begin to investigate extraterrestrial presence on earth and all of these ufo sightings and in your case implants in human beings i mean my gosh doctor that's quite a jump to take and i'm sure a very costly jump in many ways how did it oh, it was how, it was a it was a costly jump not not necessarily because of my illness but uh when I got involved in the situation, uh, you know, there wasn't any money to do research, so I started financing it myself. Right. And uh, I've dumped uh, a large sum of money and to trying to find out, you know, this kind of uh, information. Why did I do it? Yes. Uh, that's quite an interesting question. I, you know, was interested in uh, Roswell when I was a kid. I remember my father bringing the newspaper and putting it down on the kitchen table, reading the headline of my mother, uh, the U.S. Army, U.S. Army Air Force captures a flying saucer. And then he went on into a long dissertation about uh, 
uh, you know, he, I always told you, honey, that uh, you know we're not the only living intelligent beings in this vast right. universe. And I stood there as a kid in the kitchen and and listened to all this, and uh, it made quite an impression upon me. And then when the, the headline came out, you know, it's not a saucer; it's a balloon. And my, my father was a very <laughs> simple, practical person. You know, if you considered yourself a plumber, then you better know which way water went and the other stuff went, too. You know, if you were a mechanic for a car, then you better know everything about an engine. So I remember he said to my mother, and and he was irate and furious, do you mean to tell me that the United States Army Air Force can't tell the difference (laughs) between a balloon and a car? Yes, sir. That's right. Oh, okay, I, I can understand the profound impact that would have on you from your father, no doubt about it. But what I guess I mean here, Doctor, is as you, I could understand you having this as a kind of a hobby, as a kind of a thing to occupy you when you're not professionally engaged. However, as you begin a career as a physician, to decide to speak out publicly, that's a pretty big big expensive move that's you're absolutely correct and and i didn't ever expect to to be in that position i got in in this through a set of synchronicities that just sort of pushed me on i did the first surgeries uh, as a joke I thought, you know, this guy was so funny. He's calling these things, hey, you the implants. Well, you got to remember, you know, that when I started doing this, uh, even organizations like MOFON wouldn't accept alien abduction as a, a real entity. Oh, I know. You know, they, they, you know, things flying in the sky, somebody flying them, come from somewhere else. Uh, maybe they land once in a while, do this, do that, Stan Friedman talks. Uh, then sure. all of a sudden we start hearing about Betty and Barney Hill. And That's then right. And Shriver and, uh, uh, you know, a number of the other, uh, of Duck Travis Walton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, cases and then uh, John Mack appears on the scene and adds right. legitimacy to a subject. Here's a Harvard uh, professor of psychiatry and he's working with this guy Bud Hopkins and you know they're doing hypnosis and you know these things could be real. That's about the time I got into this and here's a guy who comes along and says I have X-rays of a foot with uh, alien implants. Uh, you know I, I heard that. I turned around and laughed my butt off and walked away. Mm-hmm. So somebody else told me to come back. Oh come on, listen to what he has to say. So I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, as a challenge, I said, well you know if you think these objects are so unusual, why don't you just take them out and see what they are? And even said, well, even I, at that, I, I hear you. But even at that, doctor, you you could have kept it under wraps publicly. You didn't have to begin speaking out on shows like mine and other ones. You didn't have to jeopardize your professional career. Uh, you could have kept your mouth shut and done all this quietly. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Uh, but you know, again, the synchronicity took over and. Uh, I started finding things that I couldn't understand, and I had to talk to people. You know, I just found something doing the surgery. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No. What is it? Well, I don't know. Uh, You know, how do you get the shell off? How do you get the uh, material off? I don't know. It's so hard we can't cut it through it with a a scalpel. And so the word started, uh, you know, getting around for the people I was asking, and uh, it just began to uh, spread until more people, you know, (laughs) just started piling up. More people started hearing about it. And then uh, if anybody had told me that I would uh, write a book, well, what, what I mean, I'm going to write a book on foot surgery or something else? Yeah, maybe. But uh, to write a book on something as strange as a, as abduction and implants, I would have told them they were insane. <laughs> so, yeah. So I so people say, you know, this is some interesting data. Maybe other people would want to know about this. And then I met John White, who was a book uh, agent. 
and and he becomes my agent, and I turn out writing this book. And then after that, I started out. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. I was Doctor X, Doctor P, uh, right. you know, some some guy doing these weird surgeries. And then uh, more and more and more people got interested until you know my name got out there, and I finally said, "Well, that, that's it. I've done it now. I've stepped over the line." So uh, <laughs> once you're over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay, let's go to the phones. Uh, Evan in Washington, you're on the air with Doctor X. Yes, uh, Roger uh, Art. This is Ryan from Washington. I, I actually know Roger. I'm helping him. I've helped him research this case in Turkey. Oh, do you know who he is, uh, Doctor? Yes, I certainly do, and I have to thank Ryan for uh, his kindness in uh, putting this uh, material together in uh, such a way that uh, I can have it on my computer and then use it, uh, for example, in the fashion that I sent it to you. He organized a lot of these uh, videos and gave me information that I didn't have. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, very good. Ryan, um, so that it, is that what you're doing, organizing things for the doctor? Well, yeah, basically every everything is public information already, um, and it was uh, basically broadcast all over the news in Turkey, right. and um, basically all that I've done is just uh, translated it from Turkish to English and tried to just sort of uh, uh, break the news in the United States, of, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, Roger, um, could you go into more detail about uh, you were standing on the beach, and uh, can you describe uh, what you saw? I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, it would be important for the audience to hear um, that you saw entities there, you saw occupants there. Okay. Yes. Let's do that. You know, it's one thing to see what a camera saw, and it's an entirely different thing to have actual eyes on. So, yeah, good idea. Yeah, in the first place, uh, as Ryan mentioned, uh, this was not right on the beach. It was kind of an elevated uh, platform area. Uh, where we could walk into like a very large uh, patio, and there were a number of us there. Uh, I was certainly not the only one there. And as I mentioned, in 2009, there was an whole other camera crew there with uh, Jaime Hassan and so on. But um, we, uh, you know, looked at the, the area. The sea was calm, and uh, the moon was very bright. And I was saying to myself, you know, after we surveyed the area with binoculars looking for uh, light contamination and seeing what the weather was like and no clouds and so on. And the uh, wind was a uh, very uh, sh shallow uh, breeze, uh, not enough to cause any uh, distortion in the camera, although, as I said, it was mounted on a, on a tripod. And then, uh, so to begin with, we began looking at the moon. And so we started focusing on the moon because the moon was bright. And then when we did this, uh, maybe about uh, 200 magnification, we saw a bright light that was uh, just to the left and below the moon. And so um, the camera operator moved that uh, the lens over to focus the uh, viewfinder on that bright light. And then we began zooming on that object and uh, a little bit at a time and make sure it you know, stayed in focus. And uh, there it was, you know. And so I said, look at this, look at this. And then the dog started barking, and uh, a lot of people came over, and they were astonished at what we were seeing, and they were looking through the camera. And, uh, All right, what about the occupants, Doctor? Uh, we were able to get uh, tight enough uh, on the front of the uh, on the front of the object that we could see that there was entities in these uh, three ports. The outside of the craft was being lit by the moon, but there was light that was coming from the interior of the craft that was uh, lighting this uh, uh, area uh, where these uh, entities were. Now you could see through the camera that they all didn't look like the same kind of entity. 
And, uh, you know, they were moving around and they were manipulating something. They were doing something uh, as, as we were watching them. All right. So, I'd like to add, I, I can see them and anybody can see them. If you go to the video, you, you can make out the occupants of the craft. Now, did you, were you able to, with your eyes to get any more detail? You said it was obvious they weren't the same kind of entities, but can you give us any more detail than that? Or is that about uh, with with the naked eye looking through the lens finder and the camera right. uh, uh, was just about what you're seeing now. If you go to um, full image analysis uh, under show references, uh, you're going to see analysis of the Comburgus Turkey uh, UFO videos, graphic analysis. And it was done by uh, Mario Valdez, uh, Santiago, Chile. If you scroll down the page, you'll see the first two pictures. You'll see what we saw basically through the camera was two entities, uh, which you couldn't see really distinctly. Now, right. they, and then you go down. The Not story. everybody has a computer. A lot of people listening don't have a computer. What was the basic analysis? Uh, basic analysis uh, was that these were uh, some kind of uh, entities that were manipulating some kind of machinery in the craft. Now, there are other uh, uh, photographs or, or pictures in the uh, analytical video where you can see, for example, the eyes. I mean, that's how clear it was through the camera. So all this here, all, yeah, I realize people don't, uh, everybody doesn't have a computer. but A lot of people are on they, the road right now in trucks, may, whatever. May I yeah. just, uh, interject here and say Go that, ahead, Brian. Uh, you know, it might be disturbing to some people who uh, are not used to seeing this type of thing. Um, and, and people should know that, that it might be shocking to some people. But the, uh, one thing to know about these videos is that they were given to the Turkey Scientific and Technology Board, which is sponsored by the government. And uh, they tried to debunk it, tried to debunk it, and had to finally release a two-page report that concluded that uh, these are not balloons, they're not models, etc. And then also... Uh, I've had conversations with Bruce Maccabee, and Bruce Maccabee has said publicly that to him, this is not a hoax. So, uh, you know, um, everything is pretty much uh, publicly available now for the public. If you want to see actual aliens, actual creatures, now uh, we finally, after all this time, actually have credible photographs, not um, hoaxes. Uh, like we've seen in the past, and also in Turkey, uh, Roger, maybe you could talk about the, the culture in Turkey. I mean, this was all over the headline news in Turkey, and all over Europe and everywhere, and, and, and we didn't hear a peep about it here in the United States. That's basically the reason why I've just tried to document it here. I just documented uh, what is already publicly available, and uh, just uh, translated it from Turkish to English. And I'll get off the phone and let the next caller come in. Great show, Art. I'm so glad uh, to thank you. On the air. Uh, do you do you speak Turkish? No, no, but I've had to. It, it's been quite a, quite a pain, uh, Art. I've had to uh, go and use a, a translator, uh, which is kind of crazy because uh, these translators, like Google Translator, they don't translate properly. <laughs> I know. So you have to. Yeah, I'm sure you do know because of the uh, Philippines, but. I, I've had tried to contact the the original witnesses, and there's there's multiple people there that seen this thing, and, and but to them it's no big deal in Turkey. It's 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 part of their culture. They they call them the jinn. You know the they have these underground bases there, and it's it's just fascinating. So great show tonight. You, you're probably the first major show to break this news here in the United States, and uh, it's just important that people know about it. So Ryan, thank you so thank you. very much, and and thank you for your work, and Roger will be back in a moment so we're the first to be breaking this the translated stuff all of it it's up on the website and there's a lot to go through so if you want to know whether or not they're really here this would be a case you can investigate until your eyes blur and you'll get real information this is dark matter sometimes i've got to just scratch my head 
Scott from Pasadena sends a wormhole message to me. And by the way, you can do that. Go to rbell.com. And uh, when you go to the wormhole, whatever you enter there, type in, comes to me in the form of a statement or a question or whatever. And Scott from Pasadena says, Hey, Art, enough of the guests who can only, uh, whose only questions are answered by directing people to a website. Enough already. My goodness gracious, Scott. If we have somebody on here <laughs> who comes on and makes claims and gives us nothing to back it up, you're screaming bloody murder about where's the proof? Where's the meat? Well, they give you the proof and they give you the meat and you complain about that. You just, I don't know, shaking my head, Scott from Pasadena. Most of the comments, though, are very, very good about uh, tonight's guest appearance. I mean, really good. Excellent. Um, We are getting uh, these elusive 1001 errors. Those are getting reported to me, too, uh, by the same means. And I want to correct something, or maybe I want to correct something. I'm not sure. Uh, From San Diego, your guest misspoke. According to the documentary, Why We Fly 2005, it's the Military Industrial Congressional Complex. Does that sound right, Doctor? Yes. It does? Yes. The Military Industrial Congressional Complex, and that's what it was before it became the Military Industrial Complex. That's correct. (laughs) Okay, um, back to the phones we go, and let's go to Texas, and uh, Jess, hi. Hey, Art Roswells. Um, I want to be very clear before I make my comment and ask my question that none of this is personal about Dr. Lear. You've always been a really good listener over the years, Dr. Lear, and, and I, I, I still feel that way. This is more about the credibility of a few of the things that you've said and some of the folks you brought up because I really am interested how you feel about it. Uh, it's an interesting topic. First of all, you've mentioned Senator Mike Gravel a lot of times, and you've said that he's got a PAC in Washington, an organization that he's working on this. And I, I just, frankly, sorry, I just don't think that Senator Mike Gravel is very credible. He was a senator 30 years ago from Alaska. Uh, when he ran for the Democratic nomination, he got 1% of the vote. He made Dennis Kucinich look like Henry Clay. And, frankly, You know, Senator Mike Gravel is just not the kind of guy who's going to make the government or anybody at the U.N. listen. But what really made me wonder, and and I really want your comments on this, is the idea, uh, and I'm a conservative Republican, but I don't think President Obama is stupid enough to talk to Louis Farrakhan about UFOs on the phone, by text message, by email, by instant message, or anything. And I just don't think that that's a very credible kind of uh, thing, and anybody that would would claim that, I think, frankly, loses their credibility instantly. And the other thing I was going to say, Art, is on the citizen hearing, very interesting stuff. Um, You can look it up. It's all on the web. There's videos and so forth. But each of the participants was paid $20,000 for their participation. So, you know, you have to ask, even though some of them may be very well-intentioned or credible or what have you, um, some of the participants perhaps participated because they were paid. And I do think that calls into question some of the credibility of it. So the question really, Dr. Lear, is, is not about the other things that you say, which I think are very interesting and raise a lot of provoking questions. It's more about the idea that if you're serious or if the UFO community is serious about getting information from the government or having a thing at the United Nations, why wouldn't you bring in more credible people than Louis Farrakhan and Mike Gravel and some of these other folks? Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, kind of an interesting question, I think, colored by personal politics. But nevertheless, uh, Dr. Lear, go ahead. Respond. Well, I <laughs> I don't know whether to sit here and bust out laughing or what... Um, Uh, Our caller is uh, focusing in on things that he knows, uh, obviously, made it very apparent, absolutely nothing about. Uh, Senator Mike Gravel, no matter what his uh, popularity rating or what he did uh, during the time he was in uh, Congress, was the single one person who was either the hero 
uh, or the opposite for releasing the Pentagon Papers. Uh, up until the time that Senator Gravel did this, there was one person, one congressperson at a time that was allowed in a room with no pad, no pencil, no paper, no camera, no recording devices, and they were able to look at the Pentagon Papers one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time. And he didn't think that this was the proper thing to do. So after going through the rigmarole of arguing with his colleagues, he held a filibuster in Congress and he read each one of the single papers into the congressional record. Now that takes guts. Uh, I, I don't know Senator Gravel. I never met him before in my life. I don't know what his political views are, but I've talked to him extensively about uh, things that uh, are in existence today, the world, the government, the United States government, other governments, and he's spot on. And as far as the history of this country, from where it started with its founding fathers, he's right on. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, and he's a very credible person. Now, in reference to Louis Farrakhan, uh, our caller doesn't know anything about Louis Farrakhan. He's probably never met the man. And if he has, I'd be very much surprised uh, that what he's saying has, has any credibility whatsoever. I did meet with him. I met him personally before the, uh, uh, the conference that he had on the uh, Savior's Week where I uh, gave uh, information to the American Muslim audience that he had there. Uh, but he has his own personal experiences as does his family with UFOs. Now, a lot of people don't know that. It's not public knowledge. And what I found out about his relationship with the president was not from him. He wouldn't tell me anything like that. That would be absolutely ridiculous to assume anything like that. Now, that information came to me from uh, his guards, who obviously were some branch of the uh, uh, Secret Service. Uh, they, you know, they operated with uh, armor-plated, armed uh, Hummer limousines, and uh, they were in constant contact with the Secret Service that surrounds the president. So oh, if you I, think there's no relationship. Right. It's impossible. I, I, right. I always found Farrakhan to be uh, intellectually a fascinating individual, absolutely fascinating. Um, for whatever that's worth. Now to his question about. The payment uh, that went to people for these um, uh, conferences that we're talking the first, about. The first thing, Art, that they said on the opening day of the conference is that uh, we are going to get criticized because we accepted twenty thousand right. dollars for our appearance here at this at this uh, uh, committee meeting. Now uh, he says, "I want you all to consider." that, uh, number one, we're retired Congress people, and uh, we are spending an entire week here from uh, 7.30 in the morning until late at night doing press interviews, getting very little sleep. And if you add the $20,000 that we're receiving that, it barely pays for the expenses and the loss of, of income that we have because well, they came out and said we, we charge, you know, twenty five or thirty thousand dollars for an appearance at either a Republican conference or a Democratic conclave. Okay. So, uh, in other words, in other words, they put that they put it out to the public first. They were getting paid for a solid week and more of God knows how many hours per day, uh, and studying the material. Besides, when I did my uh, my uh, testimony, when I gave my testimony, in order to stay within time constraints, I handed them at least four hundred pages. Of material, oh. mm -hmm. which they had to go through the night before. So All when right. you figure how much time they spent, hey, twenty grand a piece is not that much. Okay, well, of course, to some people it is. Um, Pete in New York, you're on the air with uh, Dr. Lear. Hi. Yes, I, I like to say it's really a great honor to speak with you tonight, and uh, and speaking with another amateur radio operator also. Uh, Mike, actually, I had a couple of uh, couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is to the doctor, and well, 
what, what do you feel the real purpose of all this is, and, and if any good will ever come out of it? Uh, that, that's my first question. Okay, the real purpose of all this, I guess, to try yeah. to get to the truth, I, I you know, doctor? Well, I think the purpose for what's going on is uh, uh, a bit... Uh, I don't. I wouldn't call it altruistic, or some entities trying to do something for the human race. I think that the human race has gotten to the point where we are initiating things which reflect elsewhere in our solar system and somewhere else. Now we know that the release of nuclear energy. The way that we've been releasing it, like in the form of a bomb, also releases a magnetic wave which comes off of this planet and leaves. We don't have the slightest idea of where it's supposed to go or okay, what Okay, we're get, getting an awful lot of noise from that line, caller. Um, he's got a good point, an, a magnetic wave, and that is moving faster than light. Uh, there's no question about it. So detectable out there, far out there, yes. Uh, caller, do you have something else? Yeah, uh, the other part of the, part of that question was: Does he feel that any any good will ever really come come out of this? <laughs> uh, it depends on what this turns out to be, uh, Doctor. What do you think? Well, uh, I'm both optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. I think uh, that from what I see on a world scale, and if you you got to look at things uh, all over the world, and you know, not listen to the news that uh, you know you, you get from the usual uh, channels, uh, uh, Earth-based channels, uh, the things you're getting now uh, are representative of the truth. You know, you listen to the Art Bell show or. Uh, some of the things that are on the internet is the first time in history where people at least have the opportunity to hear the truth about what's going on. So we have to look at the world in its entirety, and you see, and you look and you see what's going on. For example, let's, let's take the Middle East. Uh, this all started in one country, which was Egypt. And who started this conflict? The conflict was started by people less than 35 years of age who did it without a gun. They it's did true. it by using the social media. It's true. And it, it spread. Is. It spread all over the Middle East, and change is going to take place. Oh, it is change. It is taking place um, rapidly. I might add. All right, to Florida and Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Hi, Art. Uh, I was listening to yours and the doctor's uh, conversation about the UFO over Turkey. Yes. And I drive a semi truck, and I don't have a computer, so I was wondering if if it's after a week or so that I get home to look at some of these pictures on the internet. Will it still it, be there? Yeah. I would say in a week, yes, it will still be there. Um, there's a lot of material in the video uh, that you know we were talking about. Listen to me; you can see the craft again and again and again. This thing goes on for God, I don't know, um, six minutes and forty some odd seconds. And believe me, sir, you can see the craft, you can see the occupants, or that there are occupants inside, and yes, I think in a week you'll still be able to see it. All right. I think uh, you'll also be able to see it uh, through my website, which is alienscalpel.com. Alien scalpel.com and uh, you can go and look at the Combergus uh, footage there and also the uh, analysis and uh, I might mention also Art that uh, on the uh, analytical section uh, from uh, Mario that was done in Chile down towards the bottom of it there is a drawing uh, that was made by uh, David Chase from um, the, an abduction case, which is very uh, interesting. And uh, he was able to draw the beings that the uh, abductee saw on the ship. They right. were a mixture of uh, praying mantis and greys. And uh, these, the, the analyst chose these because out of a number of different pictures that he saw, these most resembled the ones that were on the ship. Doctor, do you have any idea or even a ballpark guess about how many different types of alien uh, beings are here or are frequenting our planet? 
Well, going back historically, I mean, I remember the assessment that Bob Dean talked about, <laughs> and he said, you know, at that time, what was that, in the 60s? Mm. There was, uh, what, 12 to 14 different races. Um, so, you know, it's it's a guess. There must be a bunch that have visited here or are visiting here or, oh. or are having some kind of influence. And, and how do we know that, that there's a certain number of them that are just not here all the time? Uh, you know, when we say extraterrestrial, it just means off Earth. It doesn't mean, you know, to tell you exactly where they're from, whether they're in another universe, another time. As yes, I sir. said, maybe maybe there are us uh, thousands of years in the future who have traveled back in time. There's just infinite possibilities of numbers or how many are involved. But we do know that there's uh, a, 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 probably a great number involved in the functioning of this planet. And when you stop and look at it philosophically, how do we really know? Now, I'll ask you this, Art, if you don't mind me turning the chair around the other direction. No, go ahead. Uh, uh, how do we know that the things that mankind has done here is not really being controlled from elsewhere? We don't. We absolutely don't. We don't know. We don't. That's correct. It, it feels like we're making our own decisions, uh, Doctor. But... <laughs> Um, who knows? Certainly, I, I wouldn't propose to say I know. On um, South Carolina, I believe, uh, Corey? Yes, hello. How are you guys doing tonight? Quite well, thank a, you. Thank you. I got a question. Um, it's more like a comparison thing. You know how we we kind of uh, we go into the wild, <laughs> we track animals down, we put them unconscious, we tag them? You know, I kind of compare that to the stories here about alien abductions. Almost... You think we're like animals that are uh, tracked down and tagged? Well, in looking at the uh, stats involved, I would say that from my experience uh, that about 15% of abductees wind up with an implant. And, you That's know, you, you, you got to... You got to step back, way, way, way back. And if what our scientists are telling us uh, is uh, anywhere near accurate, and we're dealing with a race that's 80 million years old, older than we are, how can we have the conceit? How can we have the ego to even understand the logic that a race that's true. that much older than we have does? It's but, true. You you said, Doctor, 15 percent. Uh, you believe are implanted after following an abduction. But you know what? How do we know that? Because what percentage of people who claim abduction or whatever are examined carefully? In other words, I think a lot, number one, keep their mouth shut about it. I was abducted. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go right out and announce that. So... I think a lot of them are not examined. Well, they? I agree with you 100%. That's why I think that the uh, Roper polls that were done were very conservative polls because uh, who's going to come along and pass out that information? Uh, I'm just saying that on the basis I run between three and 4,000 emails behind a week, and mm -hmm. then I, I have to sift through or, or I have help that doesn't sift through all that material and try and find out people that I really want to contact and talk to sure. but sure. then when you when you get down to the bare bones of who sends you an x-ray and who has an object it's about 15 uh, percent and that's that's just about what we do with uh, bears when we want to find out about their hibernation habits in the winter and the sea mammals that we we put tags on and see where they go and what they eat and what their predators are so you know based on human logic which i say is you know may not not be logic that's 80 million years older than we are, but at least based on human logic, that you know, sounds like a pretty good figure. All right. Our number, 855-REAL-UFO, brings Jeff in Tennessee. Hello. Hey, Art Mega Roswells. Hey, Thank Dr. You. Lear, I'm going to kind of run this down a different avenue. You know, we're, they're collecting data on, on us with those implants and all that. Do you think they're trying to keep an eye on how bad we're destroying our our actual <laughs> ecosystem without throughout the world, yeah. 
And that's what the hybrids are set up for to come in and be the next next go around. Well, in my in my view, you know, I look at the situation, and uh, you know, if we're dealing with intelligences that are that much older than we are, I, as I said, I don't think they're altruists that are necessarily here to help the human race. I think that they're here to uh, preserve the integrity of the universe. Uh, which we don't really understand. Uh, but uh, the things that uh, they're doing, for example, the hybrid program, uh, assuming that, that that's true, that they are building hybrids, maybe, uh, again, uh, this is just a, a, a gift is all it is, uh, but we can put forth the idea that uh, perhaps if all else fails, you know, they may have a collection of the DNA from everything that's on this earth and uh, plan to establish uh, beings that will take the place of the Homo sapien. I kind of get that feeling. It's just kind of a instinct type feeling, you know. And uh, it just what we're doing with our GMOs and plastics and everything else mm-hmm. is basically, you know, destroying the DNA code in the human race. Well, that's that's true. Uh, GMOs are doing exactly that because when you take uh, uh, DNA from a spider and you inject it into the, uh, corn seed, and then you get uh, hybrid uh, corn that you feed cattle, and then the cattle become uh, uh, congenitally deformed within three and a half years, and the plant shrinks half the size and won't take up water. I mean, you're not doing uh, you're not doing much good for the human race. You know, <laughs> that's nope. uh, really, really bad stuff. Yeah, it's not looking real good for us if we keep, keep you know, hugging our, our chemist guys, you know, or it's not looking good. And, you know, All right. when- I'm sorry. Yeah. I hit the switch by mistake and I cut him off. Uh, doctor, you know, you pointed out earlier, we're getting older, you and I. Um, with respect to yourself as a physician and a surgeon, um, where are the next Dr. Lear's coming from? Where are the next? It seems to me that the number or pool of um, PhDs, the Dr. Max, it seems like it's getting smaller and smaller, and I, I'm not sure I see the replacements. What about you? Well, I think you're right in regards to what we know. Uh, the thing is that's different is maybe in what we don't know. For example, <laughs> years ago, where were the Richard Dolans? Uh, whoever heard of Richard Dolan? Right. So, uh, un- unfortunately or fortunately, I still attend a certain number of uh, UFO conferences, and I sit there and I listen to young guys uh, who I've never heard of before, and I'm surprised at their intellect and knowledge. Uh, Jordan Maxwell, you know, is, is my age right. and uh, spent 56 years, you know, studying the, the, the way this world is put together and works. But he has a lot of students. There's a lot of students around the world that are talking about the same subjects and, and putting this information out to the public. So I don't think they've gained the... the um, it's not fame, but it's it's uh, it gained a name for themselves yet that right. they are, you know, authorities. They, you know, and again, you look at the books, you look at the literature; it's still being written. This this is being written as you and I talk uh, on this program. Okay, all right, hold it right there. We'll be right back. Going to take a break, Doctor Roger Lear, uh, certainly a legend. Doctor Lear is our guest tonight. Subject: alien implants. Raging in the night. This is Dark Matter. Hey, you know what I want to do? I want to open up uh, Skype. I'm going to open Skype right now, and I'm going to open it for everybody. And so if you have a question for Dr. Lear, here's how you reach us on Skype from anywhere in the world. You simply um, uh, come to me as art.bell51. That's me on Skype. Art. A-R-T dot, as in period, Bell, B-E-L-L, 51. Uh, So if you have a question for Dr. Lear, wherever you are, here, Canada, or the rest of the world, please get on Skype and uh, buzz me. (laughs) 
I want to play with my Skype. And by the way, we're going to have open lines in the first hour of the program tomorrow night. I repeat, open lines in the first hour of the program tomorrow night. So please uh, keep that in mind. All right. Uh, let us condemn. By the way, if I answer on Skype and you hear audio, just let it go. It means you're going to be coming up shortly. And by the way, those of you who do try Skype, please try and have headphone mic so that we can hear you well or just get real close to the mic, whatever. Uh, back now with Dr. Lear, and we go to California and Glenn. Glenn, you're on the air. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, I saw Dr. Roger Lear at a San Francisco Bay Area UFO conference uh, a few years ago, and I did write down the frequencies that the alien implants transmit. I don't know if you would like me to give that information or not. I certainly would. Uh, I would, uh, excuse me, Art, I, I wouldn't want that information on the air, if you don't mind. Really? Yeah. If really, sends, Doctor? Yeah, if, if he sends them to you um, uh -huh. and... Uh, you know, hold away. it, hold it, hold it, Doctor. I sensed earlier when we touched on that question that you didn't particularly want to... Uh, to talk about it then, and uh, and now I'm sure, and and so instead of asking about the specific frequencies, why do you not want it on the air? Because there are certain implications in these frequencies that, uh, uh, to some uh, individuals, uh, might cause problems. Really? And. Could I say uh, one more thing? Okay, call, call her. Um, would you mind then sending them to me? I am Art Bell at artbell.com. No problem. Can I mention one other thing real quickly about our DNA? Uh, it might be a quantum antenna, and using scalar waves, uh, riding along these frequencies for the aliens or whoever's uh, receiving them. Um, and I do believe that NASA and SETI and other experimental uh, frequencies in that range are in that range that were uh, mentioned by Dr. Lear, without getting into any specific frequencies. I, I agree with you 100%, and uh, I can mention that uh, one of the uh, companies involved in uh, scalar re research uh, happens to be Colquam in San Diego, and they have a full scalar laboratory. So um, really? some of the things you just got through saying are 100% accurate. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed listening to your uh, show, uh, Mr. Bell. And uh, thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you very much for the call. Um, th th see, now you've piqued my curiosity terribly. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I will get them to you. I have no fear. Uh, can I just make a quick announcement before? I, did, I just looked at my watch. I can't believe the time is going. I know. It, it moves quickly. Sure you can. Go Unbelievable. Ahead. Yeah, there's a new organization that uh, I'm part of, which is uh, ZeroInternational.com, and uh, it's a close encounter research organization, and uh, we're looking at um, at all aspects of the UFO phenomena, much as uh, MUFON used to do. But this is on a basis where uh, all the research will be turned over as fast as possible to the public. It won't be held in files. Uh, and and uh, some of the other politics that occurred with uh, some of the other organizations. Our president is Yvonne Smith, a uh, noted uh, hypnotherapist and uh, trainee of uh, Bud Hopkins. Uh, we're going to have uh, we have a meeting every other month. We're going to have one in uh, Thousand Oaks, uh, California, November the 9th. And our uh, guest for that evening is author uh, David Weatherly. Uh, I don't know if you know who David is, uh, Art. I do not. Uh, I do not. Interesting fellow who um, wrote a book on the black-eyed children, uh, strange intruders. 
He's <laughs> kind of an adventurist, uh, very interesting. I heard him before, and uh, he'll be our guest. It's uh, Thousand Oaks, uh, California, at the Thousand Oaks Inn. Uh, begins at 7.30 p.m. So those of you uh, listeners out there that are uh, in Southern California, we'd be uh, happy to have you as a guest. Okay. All right. Again, I want to specify that I've opened Skype. I hope it's working. I've got 177 recent calls, and uh, it has not yet rung. So anybody in the U.S., Canada, or outside the U.S., you're welcome to try Skype. Prove to me it's working. Uh, It's, once again, Art, period, bell, 51. And uh, there must be something about it that is not functional at the moment, but I've got it open and waiting. And to California we go with Larry. Uh, you're on the air with Dr. Lear. Hi. Hi, how are you, Art? Art, I'm a longtime listener. I live in the Antelope Valley, high desert. Uh, I see a lot of things. I worked for a large aircraft corporation for 30 years, mm-hmm. and now I'm retired. And I've been noticing that uh, praying mantises have been getting very large out here in the Antelope Valley. Uh, I had one the other day on my hand, and it was making gestures with its hand to me and its mouth, not going crazy. And I got too close to it to look to see what it was trying to say, and it was making small words, but I couldn't hear it. And then all of a sudden, it made the worst smell. I put it back on the wall, and it took off, and a lizard went after it. The lizard caught it, and it turned around and killed the lizard. The lizard fell to the ground dead. Uh, it was if you take your hand and it was as wide as your fingers just spread apart from the little finger to the thumb. I've never seen one that big before. So you guys talking about uh, praying mantises as with the grays. Uh, I highly believe in UFOs, and I just thought I'd let that let you hear that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the world seems to be made up of two schools of thought: those who absolutely believe, like this last fellow. And those who, you know, doctor, almost don't believe as a religion. I mean, they're, they're almost, they, they almost have a religious fervor about their non-belief. Yes, that's true. I agree with that. But some of that is extended to other aspects of uh, human life, especially, especially here in the United States. Uh, I, you know, I always said that people ask me all the time, would uh, we able we would be able to handle it? You know, if the public knew, would we be able to handle it, or would be a panic? Uh, and, and my answer to that is, if a, a huge craft, you know, five football fields uh, in, in length, uh, huge width, landed on a freeway, let's say in Southern California during rush hour, uh, how would the people react? Mm-hmm. And my answer to that would be they most of them would be on their cell phones or some other form of media, and they would be calling Caltrans for the state of California to get the thing moved because they had to get somewhere or to the Rams game. They wouldn't oh, care yeah. whether it came from a billion miles from That's space right. or ten light years, right. but it's it it would have to interrupt your normally normal routine of life before there'd be some kind of panic. Okay. All right. Um, let me try Skype. Let me see if we've got somebody. C. Pickle, are you there? C. Pickle is not there. Okay. Well, I'm trying. I'm getting, I'm getting people calling, but I'm for some reason not connecting. So, uh, Indiana, George, you're on the air. Hi, Art. I have a quick question. I don't know if it's a question, but here goes. Here goes. Uh, I was wondering when you were talking about the people in Turkey being used to seeing that kind of thing. Do you think that might be some sort of uh, I don't know prehistoric memory that might just be in you know what I mean in their DNA or whatever that gets them used to it? And also, here comes another part of that. Uh, what about uh, you know Noah's Ark landed over there? Maybe that could have been them uh, spreading the DNA out or collecting DNA. That was it. I just didn't know if that makes any sense or not, but I thought I'd give it a shot. Doctor? Well, I don't think that there's anything different about the people of Turkey than in Brazil or Costa Rica or Russia or anywhere else. 
I think they're basically the same DNA as we are. It's just that uh, the government uh, is open, and uh, the sub- the subject is uh, everywhere. You can read it in the newspaper. <laughs> it's on a lot after these sightings and the report uh, had not come out of the University of Istanbul as to whether this was uh, uh, photoshopped footage or whether it was real or whatever. Right. Uh, I did a number of uh, television programs, and the arguments were, uh, the, you know, they argue in on a, on a, on a public forum, uh, you know, right to your face. Well, you know, just because you look through the camera, how do you know it was real, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, afterwards, that kind of died down until the report came out from the University of Istanbul. And then, boy, we were on TV like, crazy on really big shows. All right. Uh, All right. Well, you know. it's my it's my view, Doctor. I've been dealing with UFO pictures, creature pictures now for years and years and years. And inevitably people complain about them being too blurry, uh not taken well, went uh, somebody who went and grabbed the worst camera they own, or very occasionally, too good. And when they're too good Then they're always photoshopped or they've been tampered with in some manner. It can't possibly be true because it's too good. So uh, once again, folks out there, uh, 1-855-REAL-UFO. That's 1-855-732-5836 or Skype. If you want to give it a try, I really, really am wanting to play with this. And maybe it's maybe it's not working is what I'm thinking. Um, But give it a try. So we know it works. Art dot bell 51 if you can manage to call me on skype i will absolutely take your call uh florida brings james hello james roswell dart good evening Thank doctor you. Uh, I, got evening, two james. Quick, I got two quick questions and i'll list offline one is a few years back i saw a video where they had an implant they were trying to remove from a guy's shoulder or in his neck and every time they'd get close to it, it would move like you mentioned earlier. I just wondered if that was you, doctor, that did that, or if you know what happened about that one. And the other one is... Where did you see Where did you see that, caller? I saw that on TV on one of them. Um, it was about aliens or UFOs, one of them specials I had. And they showed the operation. It was, like I said, every time they'd go to try and remove it, you could watch it, and it would move. And I was curious about that. You actually other, saw you actually saw it move. Yes, sir. Saw it on. It was on TV on one of the UFO specials. Mm-hmm. And the other question is: If there is a fleet of of spacecraft, does the doctor? Do you know what is power in that, or do you know where the power source comes from? Was it from Roswell or from other aliens? Uh, anything in that area that you might know about? And I was well. Let's you, let's. Uh, thanks for calling. Uh, and in reference to the object that moved, that probably was uh, my case. I did a case of uh, an airline hostess who had an object uh, in her uh, arm that would move anywhere within the circumference of a two and a half inch circle. And before the surgery was performed, um, I could put my, and this has all been videoed, I I have this every time I see it, it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck, but you could put your finger next to it, and after it got to know you, it seems, you could move your finger, and it would follow your finger anywhere in this two-and-a-half-inch circle. Wow. Uh, When we went to remove it, uh, there was another surgeon and myself. It took uh, four hands to trap it, and it wasn't really attached to any um, undersurface uh, structures, the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, most of them, you know, have to be you know, surgically excised, removed with an instrument. But this one, all we had to do was trap it, and once we trapped it, we just lifted it out. And it was about the size of a very large pea. It was yellow in color, and it had some uh, coarse lines running up either side, and it was bivalved. In other words, it opened from the middle. It would open and close like a, a clam. 
Now, please, please, please. I mentioned this uh, on a television show, and it got shown, and I got uh, hundreds of emails uh, from people who said, Dr. Lear said he removed a clam from a person's arm. No, <laughs> it was not a clam. It was a bivalve, and it acted like a clam. But... Um, we didn't get too far with the analysis because most of these objects are preserved in uh, the serum of the patient or the host. And we put it in this uh, serum, refrigerated it, and within about seven days it began to uh, dissolve. I still have the the serum uh, with the material in it. So uh, as soon as we have enough uh, funds, uh, we're going to go back and uh, do some chemistry on it. Okay. All right. Uh, let's try uh, taking a call. On, uh, I believe it's uh, Mike Reagan. Is that right? Yes. On Skype. Well, bless your heart. I closed Skype and opened it back up again, and there you were. I have the same problem, Art. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where Where are you? I am in uh, Central California. Okay. Get good and close to the microphone on the computer. Okay. Very important. And go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah. My question was... Uh, to the doctor, and it, it is, it's kind of a goofy one, but I see the lights on the aircraft. Uh, number one, you wouldn't think that they would need the lights. Uh, and number two, that is, I can't uh, uh, remember if that was during the Gulf War. Why didn't uh, the U.S. Uh, aircraft, ca you know, would pick that up or be interested in? Okay, it? now you're talking about lights on UFOs, right? Yes, on the on the on the images that the doctor provided on the site. Okay, yeah, pretty good question, doctor. Uh, those lights, and thank you very much, Jack, for calling. Those lights uh, are indeed interesting, um, and a lot of people have asked that very same question: why Why do UFOs need lights at all? In fact, it just calls attention to them. Of course, maybe that's what they want. Uh, no, but I do have an answer, and. Uh, okay. <laughs> It comes from uh, some extensive uh, uh, conversations with uh, physicists. Uh, the human organism, uh, particularly, uh, you, you know, Art, that your cat can see things you can't. Right. So the human organism, uh, the eye is only excited by certain electromagnetic frequencies in a visual spectrum. So what we perceive as light is mostly uh, not light. It's These are energy fields, and we're seeing um, different energies in different colors. And this is the same thing that's uh, true uh, during the abduction phenomena where someone is usually describes a bluish white light that comes down mm -hmm. over them and they float up uh, in the light. It's not light. It's a, it's a beam of energy, but because our eye only looks at certain degrees of the electromagnetic spectrum, we perceive it as light. How many people have uh, looked at the undersurface of triangles and said there's a light in each corner and a red one in the middle? Well, I, again... I would... I would be a person like that, actually. Not yeah. not in the middle, but okay. the one so, I saw had had lights on each um, end of the uh, triangle. Right, and that is what we perceive as light, but it's probably energy, and that, that we see well it. We see the light, the light form. Okay. So when this I, when this craft was approaching, you know, it was probably moving, but when it became stationary, uh, those lights disappeared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I noted that. Uh, Jack on Skype, you're on the air. Hello, Art Roswells. Thank you. Where are you? I'm in Seattle. Seattle. Okay, excellent. Yay, Skype is working now, wow. finally. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I'll tell you later. Is Dr. Lear there? Yes, oh yes. Yes, Hello, I Dr. am. Dr. Lear, I've been a fan of yours for years. Go ahead, Jack. I can't hear Dr. Lear. Dr. Lear, say yeah. something. Yes, Jack, I can hear you. Can't hear him at all. You don't hear that's him? Okay. Just, no, not even remotely. Ooh, that's not good. Uh, Hello, I'll Jack. Just ask my question and then take my answer off the air. Okay, go ahead, go ahead and pose the question. Okay, is Dr. Lear aware that there's this large hexagonally shaped vortex at the North Pole of Saturn rotating at a period of 10 hours and 40-some minutes at supposedly the same uh, period as some sort of radio emission from the planet? 
Okay, uh, we'll we'll take that. Have you heard of that uh, at all, Doctor? Yes, I have, uh, and in fact, I had uh, some extensive uh, conversations with Norman Bergram, who wrote the book uh, Ringmakers of Saturn. Uh, that's one of the features of Saturn, which he uh, was talked to me about. Uh, also, it involves uh, the uh, beta ring. Uh, most of the rings of Saturn uh, continue continuously around the planet, except for the beta ring, which starts in one area, goes around, meets the same area, and then turns around again and goes backwards. And at that spot, there's a, retang- a rectangular object. So uh, there's some mysteries about Saturn, uh, which undoubtedly go down in uh, ancient history. Okay, let's try it one more time uh, on Skype. Uh, Daniel, you're on the air with Dr. Lear. Hello, Daniel. Going once, going twice, gone. Daniel is gone, okay. Um, Let's go over here. I think I got the problem fixed. I hope I did. Uh, Patrick in Ohio. Hi, Art. How are you today? Uh, Very well, thank you. Uh, I just had one, uh, well, I had one question earlier, but he answered it, and that was, I was going to ask how many, how widespread it was with the implants and the adductees, and he said it was about 15%. But I was going to ask, again, about, uh, he had mentioned the hybrids. How would that tie in with the platinum children, or do you know anything about that? Well, the platinum children is just the name, as Art mentioned before, for a, a new a human, uh, which I prefer to call Homo noeticus, but they're called star children, millennium children, right. and on and right. on and on. Many names. It's many names. Does that have any? Uh, would, I mean, does that have anything to do with uh, perhaps abductees being taken and the the ova being taken from the woman and the sperm being taken from the the man and those being created and sent back down to us or? Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that's exactly the situation that's going on. They're producing a different kind of human being, which I hope will have a better consciousness so that they are better caretakers of the planet and each other. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, caller. We are right up against a break. Got lots of people now calling on Skype. How about that? Dr. Roger Lear, a legend uh, in this time, is my guest. He's a surgeon, a doctor, a surgeon, removes implants. It's quite a calling. We'll be right back. All right. I'm actually kind of excited. I swear if I had more time, I'd keep going tonight. I don't think I'd stop at the top of the hour. Really finally got Skype going. Check it out. Uh, Here comes King all the way from, I think, Germany. Uh, King, welcome to the program with Dr. Lear. Yes, sir. I heard it's where, Great to hear from you. Where are you, by by the way? In Stuttgart, Germany. Stuttgart. Okay. Excellent. Well, you're on the air with Dr. Lear. Yeah, Dr. Lear. It's great to hear from you. Oh, so I was wondering about to, uh, um, if you kept any of the uh, devices you removed from uh, the patients. Uh, he's asking if you kept them, doctor. Uh, we keep all of them until uh, the very, very uh, end when they are a very tiny piece, which is left over uh, after going through the fires of research. Excellent. Well, I just want to say, Art, that I really appreciate you back on the air. I'm a Las Vegas transplant here in Germany, and the Skype line really works. It really does. All right. Thank you so much, my friend, and take Thank care. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right, uh, there you have it, all the way from Germany. So it does work. It just took a little work on my end. Um, So, Dr. Lear, you literally eat these things alive. In other words, uh, when you get an implant, uh, it's sliced and diced, and everybody gets a little piece that they can experiment with. Is that about right? That's right, except we uh, have an order that we do it. We first do all the uh, exterior examination. For example, at one time, you may remember that I told you it was covered with a biological membrane, and uh, it resulted in the fact that there was no rejection or inflammation reaction by the body. I think right. you probably recall that. Now yes, we 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 realize that this membrane is uh, not external. 
but that there is a phase somewhere, for lack of a better term, in which the inorganic material that the uh, implant is made of becomes biological. And again, this is another baffling thing to academic science. Uh, maybe maybe black budget science can do it, but <laughs> academic science doesn't know how. I understand. All right, let's try Daniel on Skype. Daniel, are you there? I am here. Uh, yeah, uh, Mega Roswell's art. Um, I do have just a couple of quick, real, real quick questions for the doctor. Um, concerning the, t the Turkish UFOs that were cited or right. seen between 2007 and 2009, did you have any witnesses that... <clears throat> saw those UFOs enter the ocean or actually make landfall? Uh, not, not that particular UFO, but there is uh, reports uh, from Turkey, Australia, New Zealand, and many other different places in the world, including the United States, the coast of California, off of Catalina, where um, UFOs, and they call them USOs, Hmm. go uh, into the water, and then uh, we'll come back out, break water, and uh, do whatever it is they do. A quick uh, question for you, Daniel. Where are you? Oh, I'm in uh, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. All right. Well, thank you very much for the call, and take care. And another Skype call. Here's Frank from somewhere. Hi, Frank. Where are you? Hello, Frank. Going once. Going twice. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. okay. Go ahead, Frank. Go ahead, Frank. I guess not. Okay, uh, we'll go back over here to the lines and say, hello in California, you're on the air with Dr. Lear. That would be Eric. Hello, Art. Um, I've got a question for you. This is the second time I've actually got to talk to you, but I have listened to pretty much all of your shows, and all your guests give you a lot of information in regards to the UFOs, and I hear about... Um, different people that disappear or die of uh, different circumstances that everybody thinks is suspicious. Right. My question for you is, and your guests, do you guys ever worry about your own safety? <laughs> um, I can answer for myself. There have been a couple of times over the years, um, and I don't really want to talk a lot about it, but yeah, there's been a couple of times. How about you, Doctor? Yeah, there's been a couple of times where I've been aware that uh, there are uh, external influences that uh, may be rather uh, deleterious to my existence. Mm. Right, and uh, probably better not to talk a whole lot about it. Uh, Kentucky brings uh, Debbie without a lot of time. Hi, Debbie. Hey, uh, when I lived in uh, Indiana, just barely north of Louisville, I was taking care of a sick horse, and so I woke up at 3 in the morning and like, oh, God, I got to check on her. I run out. It was very rural, a map guy. And there above the tree line, about 100 feet, two white lights with a red that they were touching and silent. And that made me wonder when the doctor said, when they're stationary, you don't see the lights. It was floating stationary. And I looked at it for a couple seconds, and it slowly went to the left and made a right angle and went from zero to 3,000 or more miles per hour instantly. So fast, in fact, when I turned around to see where it went, it was already gone. And um, I told my neighbor about it, and he said, yeah, there's a lot of uh, sightings out here. I think it's because we have an air beacon. And the only people I ever met that had heard of Mab, Indiana, were pilots, because there's an air beacon there. So what do you think? Well, number one, in reference to the lights, uh, I was only uh, talking about that uh, one case in uh, uh, Comburgus, Turkey. Uh, there has been uh, UFOs that have been seen that are stationary, and you can see lights that are on. But uh, in reference to the uh, UFO in Turkey, uh, when it seemed to have stopped, the lights went out. So at least, you know, as I mentioned before, they're probably not lights. It's, it's energy we're seeing, and the energy dissipated or was turned off. All right, Dr. Lear, you know, we're out of time. I'm so sorry. I could keep going. I could keep going. But um, we are out of time. It has been an honor 
to have you on the program. Uh, you're kind of a legend in this time. Certainly uh, over this matter, you are the authority, and I, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Well, it was an absolute pleasure, Art, and I'm really sorry we didn't get to touch on the Virginia case because there's some new stuff, and uh, but uh, maybe some other time. Another night, another show. Uh, good right. night, my friend. Take good care. Night, Art. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, that's it, folks. I'm sorry. We really are just flat out of time. Uh, leaving a lot of calls on the board. And tomorrow night, tomorrow night, we're going to do open lines in the first hour before our guest. How unusual is that? And I'll have Skype up and running. And it'll be running right because I got it figured out tonight, finally. <laughs> Good night, everybody.